Service Committee. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Whereas the City of Santa Barbara recognizes the invaluable contributions of telecommunicators to our community safety and well-being, Whereas telecommunicators serve as the vital link between individuals in distress and emergency response personnel, demonstrating unwavering dedication, professionalism, and compassion during every call. And whereas the safety of our police officers and firefighters is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who telephone the City of Santa Barbara's Combined Communications Center. And whereas these dedicated professionals work tirelessly around the clock often under stressful conditions to ensure swift and effective responses to emergencies, accidents, and crises within our city. And whereas National Telecommunications Appreciation Week provides an opportunity for our community to express gratitude and appreciation for the critical role telecommunicators play in maintaining public safety and enhancing the quality of life in Santa Barbara. Now therefore, I, Randy Rouse, as Mayor of the City of Santa Barbara, do hereby proclaim April 14 through 20, 2024, to be National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week in Santa Barbara in honor of the men and women whose diligence and professionalism keep our cities and citizens safe. Congratulations. I'm going to keep it very brief. I I'm not going to make Katie speak, but I do want to acknowledge Katie. Our, she's our dispatch uh, manager. And in our communication center, it's fire and police dispatch. And just to give you a uh, idea of how many calls for service come in through the dispatch center, in 2023, there were 124,680 calls that either came in through 911 or the non-emergency lines. We do that with 18 dispatchers. Uh, that includes our dispatch manager and our supervisors. They're all working uh, supervisors in the dispatch center. I'm happy to report that uh, two of our newest dispatcher, he's been here, this is day two. This is uh, his second week. So we have been uh, very successful in hiring lately and we currently only have one vacancy in our dispatch center. So we have made significant strides and I wanna give all the credit to the uh, great trainers that you also see who have been here longer and uh, have all of the responsibility of training all these great uh, new men and women that we've been hiring. So hats off to them, but we could not uh, serve our community the way in which we do without them being on the other end of the phone, providing that vital life-saving voice at the other end of the line. So I just want to acknowledge that, acknowledge all of the great men and women that do that, that no one ever gets to see because they're behind the behind the phone and not out in front. So. With that, thank you very much. Hey, get one quick picture. Come on, you win it. Everyone in? Sure. Sound like we know each other. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so apparently we have one mic working, so, and it'll be yours. So it's for Fair Housing Month, April 2024. Whereas April is National Fair Housing Month, celebrating the passage of the Federal Housing, Fair Housing Act in April 1968, which prohibits discrimination concerning the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, or familial status. And whereas the 2024 theme for National Fair Housing Month is Fair Housing, the Act in Action. And whereas according to the 2023 Fair Housing Trends Report, Despite the local, state, and federal laws prohibiting discrimination, more than 33,000 uh, fair housing complaints were filed, the most ever filed in a single year, alleging discrimination based on one, more, one or more of the Fair Housing Act's seven protected classes. Uh, 
And whereas in 2022, the most recent nationwide data on record, California had the highest number of fair housing complaints, nearly doubling the number of complaints lodged in the second highest state and one fifth of all complaints lodged in the United States that year. And whereas the city of Santa Barbara is committed to advancing equity in housing and upholding fair housing practices and is proud to provide the community with a rental housing mediation program established in 1976, which provides at no cost to participants education, eviction prevention, mediation with a successful out of court resolution of res rental housing disputes, thereby assisting in the prevention of homelessness. Now, therefore, I, Randy Rouse, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Santa Barbara, California, do hereby proclaim April 2024 as Fair Housing Month. I thank the local fair housing advocates for their service to the community, and I urge all community members to educate themselves to better understand and exercise their rights to equal housing opportunities. Congratulations, Mr. Pavan. You do. Thank you, Mayor Rouse and uh, council members. Uh, I'm Andrea Bavano, Rental Housing Mediation Supervisor. It's an honor for me to accept this proclamation along with uh, Laura Doubles, our Housing and Human Service Manager, Raymond Rango, Rental Housing Mediation Recording Specialist. Recording in progress. And Diana Santiago, Administrative Assistant. It is very important as a community to celebrate and, and recognize National Fair Housing Month and the Fair Housing Act. 56 years after the passage of the act, discrimination in housing is still very prevalent and continues to be reported at the highest numbers ever. This fact substantiates the continued need for the promotion of equal opportunity and access to housing for all. The housing and urban developments theme this year is Fair Housing, the Act in Action. The Act needs to be put in action through awareness and education for impact and change to occur at every level within our society, beginning with our local community, and that is what we're doing here today. The city has a fair housing display at City Hall, which provides information on how to file a fair housing complaint and issued a press release, as well as mention of Fair Housing Month in the City News and Brief and the City's website. The City of Santa Barbara partners with the City of Goleta and the City of Carpinteria for the provision of rental housing mediation program services, which includes the education of landlord-tenant rights and responsibilities and mediation services at no charge to program participants. Thank you for your continued support of the rental housing mediation program and fair housing. Mr. Mayor, apparently we need to reset the microphones. I don't believe your microphones are, are working at this point. No, okay, so I would recommend a 15 minute recess to be able to reset from up here.
announcements. We will now reconvene the meeting. Um, the meeting was duly called to order. Somewhere around two o'clock, we already did the Pledge of Allegiance. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Councilmember Harmon is not present. Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez? Present. Councilmember Friedman? Here. Mayor Patem Jordan? Here. Councilmember Sandin? Here. Councilmember Alejandro Gutierrez? Here. And Mayor Russ? Here. And uh, we did uh, a couple of ceremonial items, items one, items two. With those done and out of the way, Adam, uh, Administrator, are there changes to the agenda? No, Mr. Mayor, no changes. Thank okay, you. very good. Uh, we'll move to the consent calendar. You have some items to read. Yes, Mr. Mayor, item two, ordinance amending the municipal code relating to contracting for public works projects, ordinance adoption, recommendation the council adopt by reading of title only and ordinance of the council of the city of Santa Barbara amending sections 4.52.050, 4.52.165, and 4.52.200 of the Santa Barbara municipal code relating to contracting for public works projects pursuant to approval by the voters of the proposed amendment to city charter 519. Item four, restructure of domestic violence solutions loan on property located at 521 West Victoria Street, ordinance adoption. Recommendation the council adopt by reading a title only an ordinance of the council of the city of Santa Barbara approving a restated loan agreement in the amount of 430,000 with domestic violence solutions secured by a restated deed of trust and a 90 year affordability control covenant imposed on real property located at 521 East Victoria Street and authorizing the community development director to execute such agreements subject to approval as to form by the city attorney. Item five, certification, certification of election results for the special municipal election of March 5th, 2024, resolution. Recommendation the council adopt by reading of title only a resolution of the council of the city of Santa Barbara reciting the fact of the special municipal election held on March 5th, 2024 and declaring the result and setting forth such other matters as required by the state elections code. And item six, accept grant funding and award the Clean Streets, Clean Seas Project Resolution Agreement. Recommendation of the Council A, adopt by reading of title only, a resolution of the, of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara accepting a grant from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Sea Grant College Program in the amount of 590,481 and amending resolution number 23076, adopting the budget for fiscal year 2024 to increase revenue and expenditure appropriations by 590,481 in the Sustainability and Resilience Department fiscal year 2024 miscellaneous grants fund. All right, very good. Is there anyone on council that needs to pull an item for discussion from the consent calendar? Madam Clerk, is anyone on the line that has indicated they want to speak on a consent item? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay, very good. And with that, I will entertain a motion on consent items. So moved. moved by Friedman. Second. Second by Snedden. May we have the vote, please? Yes, this is a, this is a motion by Council Member Friedman, seconded by Council Member Snedden for the entirety of the consent calendar. Please go ahead and vote. Do we have, um, uh, very good. It actually passes six zero with Harmon absent. Yeah. So, we, no, I think it's, uh, it's, it's been recorded that she's not here, so we can't vote for her. And, is that correct, Madam Clerk? Yes, yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay, very good. Uh, with that, we'll take a report from the Finance Committee from uh, Chair Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, today in the meeting, we had a report um, from the Finance Director about the annual audit, and we, have a, we had a clean audit. Uh, the city had no issues. We have a strong financial position and we have been awarded 30 years in a row uh, recognition for excellence through the Government Finance Officers Association and the committee moved the recommendation to council that the Finance Committee recommended the city, uh, that the city council accept the annual comprehensive financial report for fiscal year ended June 30th, 2023. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And with that, we'll move to general public comment. We have three minutes at the podium on any item that is within our authority and is not on today's agenda. 
and we'll begin with Rob Fredericks. Good afternoon, Mayor Rouse and council members. It's my pleasure to be here today to highlight the Housing Authority's five-year action plan, which was recently published and began April 1st of this month, the beginning of our fiscal year. Available in hard copy and on our website, the, this blueprint is not just a vision, but a commitment to progress that dovetails seamlessly with the city's housing element. We've laid out a summary of our accomplishments over the past five years, reflecting our persistent efforts to, despite daunting challenges in providing affordable housing, which is a crisis felt at all levels uh, from national to local. As we pivot to the future, our plan is anchored by six strategic goals, each with clear, actionable steps. And I'll just read those off for you real quick. The first one is to create and preserve quality, affordable housing opportunities for the community. We are dedicated to not just creating, but also preserving the essential fabric of our community, uh, which is quality, affordable housing. Uh, two, maintain the Housing Authority's strong fiscal position and ability to respond to economic conditions by safeguarding our financial health. We ensure our readiness to weather economic shifts and serve the community consistently. Three, encourage client stability and upward mobility through community building, engagement, and partnerships. We aim to bolster stability and mobility among our clients through proactive community engagement and forging robust partnerships with other nonprofits. Four, foster a culture of excellence and innovation in our work environment. Our work culture is poised to foster innovation with a pledge to excellence as our standard. Five, promote sustainable practices. The adoption of sustainable practices will be at the heart of our operations, reflecting our commitment to both our community and the planet. And finally, six, continue to strengthen relationships with the city and county to further the Housing Authority's role as the city's affordable housing provider. And um, th this plan, as you read through it, it's, it's a repository of great data and insights. It's a tool that all of us can employ in driving informed conversations and in tracking our collective progress over the next half decade. And uh, your support and collaboration as well as city staff uh, are invaluable as we transform these goals into tangible results and together we can fortify the foundation of our community where everyone has a place to call home. So thank you for your time and your commitment to making Santa Barbara a city of opportunity for all. And I hope you enjoy reading this and get some good information out of it. Thank all you. right, thank you. And thank you for letting us steal some of your pictures for the State of the City address as well. I don't know if you knew about that. Uh, okay, with that, um, are there anybody online that needs to speak to on general public comment? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay, very good. And uh, we will go to uh, council member committee assignment reports. Are there any? Okay, very good. And with that, we'll move to our administrative uh, 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 agenda. And we'll go with item nine. Would you read the item into record, please? Yes, item nine, short-term rental enforcement pilot program update and request for extension. All right, very good. And this was uh, Mr. Way is going to be doing the report, I think. Uh, well, Mr. Alba. Okay, very good. All right. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Major Rouse, City Council members. Uh, for those in the audience and, and at home, my name is William Alva. I'm the City Attorney Investigator. I'm here today to present you an update on the uh, Short-Term Rental Enforcement Pilot Program. Uh, go ahead, Clint. Look over here. Uh, so about a year ago, we came to Council and requested funds to um, 
began a program with the city attorney's office regarding short-term rental enforcement. Um, the program is set to expire at the end of this fiscal year. Um, the city attorney's office had to create this program from ground because we did not have that enforcement in our, in our office, so we had to create everything from the ground up. And we used the funding that the city council approved very wisely. And I'll go throughout the steps of what we did to save money and, and, and doing some enforcement. Since the inception of the program last year, we have uh, collected in past taxes, revenue, and penalties and interest about $595,797 and some change. So it's, uh, so far we're doing good. Next slide. Our recommendation for council today would be to extend the program another fiscal year, uh, and we'll go more about why we wanna do that. So like I said at the beginning, we had to create the program from from scratch in a sense, and uh, one of the first things we did is uh, went through several uh, software companies that could uh, surface the web or, or search the web for short-term rental listings, which is the, the key issue that we needed to uh, identify and identify the rental listings. We met with several uh, software companies who provided the service, and out of the three software companies we met with, uh, we decided to go with uh, Decker Technologies who offer short-term rental identification and monitoring for a, a way cheaper price that we have been, uh, uh, that we had thought it was gonna cost. Uh, the other two proposals were between 150 and $450,000. Decker came at $35,000 for the same services. So uh, as uh, our office decided to, it was the same service for, for a better price, we decided to go with Decker Technologies. Uh, we also decided that we needed to have a way for the community to report complaints regarding short-term rentals. And we knew that Decker was gonna need time to search the web and find the listing, so we created a hotline and an online forum where citizens can file complaints regarding short-term rentals in their communities. Uh, we thought that was a, a better proactive step of doing that and keeping track of, of the complaints that were out there. Uh, so, and then we had made a decision or had thought about hiring either a private investigating company or uh, independent contractors to investigate each of these cases. We soon realized after interviewing a few companies that not only do we have to teach them how to conduct these investigations because they're very complex, um, and that we, we also have to give them access to our databases to locate property owners and, and responsible parties. Uh, so John, Dom John Dormas from our office, assistant city attorney, uh, came to the idea of hiring retired law enforcement uh, personnel which have the experience of dealing with the community, have conducted investigations, and have that verbal judo that we call of, of talking to people. And then we figured out by doing that, we can hire them and train them and they can work out of our office and was the safest and, and cost effective way of, of putting the program together. Uh, the great thing about this is our leadership with Sarah Connect who allow us to toss these ideas and come up with a game plan was, it was fundamental. Having the ability to troubleshoot through this was great. So that's how we ended up putting the program together. And the other reason we went with retired law enforcement is because since they already have the investigative skills and experience, all we had to teach them was the municipal codes and how they apply inland and coastal, which I'm summarizing how easy it is, but it's very complex. Uh, and, and they've done a great job of learning in the very few weeks that they, we had them. And then they were just taking complaints as they came in and learning on, on the fly and having their experience really helped out in, in making that happen. Next slide. Since the program launched in August, uh, we have opened approximately 151 cases, as the slide shows. 57 of those cases are still in progress, meaning that there are several st different stages of completion. So when the investigators are taking on these complaints and cases, they're working on multiple cases at once. So um, having a workload that heavy is, for an average person, would be very difficult. Based on their experience and professionalism, they're able to handle that. Uh, out of those uh, 151 cases, 45 cases, we obtained voluntary compliance, which means the investigators found the list, or were, found the listings, or were provided the listings via our complaint, contacted the property owners, told, told them why they couldn't do a short-term rental if they were inland. If they're in the coastal zone, they explain the, the financial requirements of paying their business taxes, GOTs, and TBID, which is uh, something most, some of them say they didn't know. So they were able to explain that, and through their ability to speak with them and build that report, we're able to convince them to pay that back taxes and, and, and comply with our municipal code, which is, which is great. And I know council, uh, when we came with this proposal last year, emphasized that they wanted us to work with the property owners and gain volunteer compliance, and, and we took that to heart. Um, 18 of those cases found to be unfounded, meaning that 
Someone called a complaint, said, I believe there's a short-term rental at this address because either they see a lot of food traffic or they see uh, out-of-state license plates. So the investigators went to that property, spoke with the property owner, spoke with the tenants and verified that there was uh, a, a long-term uh, resident at that, at that location. So any complaint, they, most of the complaints that came to us, we always went out there and, and, and knocked on the door and spoke with not only the tenants at the, at the residence, but at the with the neighbors as well. Since our, since our program was uh, created, we did get a lot of calls from uh, Carpinteria, Goleta, Montecito. People complained about short-term rentals in their communities. Uh, unfortunately, we had to direct them to the county, explain it to them that our jurisdiction is within the city limits, and we don't have the outreach of going to Montecito, Carpentry, or Goleta to investigate those cases. We did forward those complaints to the county and provided those persons with the phone number to the county because they have a north and south uh, district, the way they have the county divided, so we provide them those numbers uh, as needed. Uh, uh, fortunately, um, some of those cases that uh, some of the property owners who did not comply we did have to prepare a report and, and submit it to our city prosecutor Danny Way for, uh, for a filing. Um, breaking it further down, out of the 151 uh, cases that we have, 106 of them were uh, complaint based, meaning a citizen called you to the hotline or, filed, or completed the form online and, that, and it came as a, as a complaint. 33 of those are still in progress. We abated 36 of them. There was 19 of them were filed with Danny. 12 of those were unfounded and six of them were outside the city limits. Proactive enforcement, uh, Rentalscape provided us with a um, list of short-term rentals that they identified throughout the city. And I will go more into the numbers of how many are those. Out of that list, the investigators have been taking those out of the list and proactively uh, investigating those. So, but our main priority has always been complaint-based uh, short-term rental complaints. So, uh, and then for the proactive enforcement, so far 24 of those are in progress. Nine of them were abated, six were filed, and six were found to be unfounded. Next slide. This is a snapshot of our dashboard that we get from Rentalscape. Um, they identified 1,298 those of short-term rentals within the city, taking out the 151 they were already uh, working on. And that leaves us with 1,147 short-term rentals that we still have to investigate. Um, and the, the, the picture doesn't really come out that great, but there are blue dots indicate a short-term rental that has an active listing, meaning that a person can go into that website and rent a, uh, a stay. The gray ones are the ones where they took down their listings. Uh, Rentalscape still has that data that we can use to go back and, and contact the property owners to investigate if they have paid their taxes. And if they're not, then we'll contact, we'll be contacting them and asking them to uh, pay their taxes back. Next slide. This is just a, a collection of the data as, as council has requested. We are collecting the data of how many cases we have in the city, how many have been investigated, and how many do we still have left over, which is still significant. Now, 1,147 of them still have to be investigated. Next. So then, uh, we talk about our team that we hire. We have all three of our investigators in the back. We have Sharon Giles, special investigator. She is a retired commander with the city of Oxnard. Sam Arroyo who is a retired commander with the Ventura Police Department. Joy Lewis Reyes was a retired commander with the Ventura County District Attorney's Office. Alex Arnett, who is present here, is a retired commander with the Oxnard Police Department. And uh, having to calculate the past taxes, we do need a financial analyst to aid us with that. So the investigators were conducting the uh, analysis of the, of the past due taxes. We found it to be very time consuming. I, I, I'm a very proud of them of learning how to you know, how to, find, how to calculate the, back, the past taxes because it's, it's a difficult formula. Uh, there's a lot of information that needs to be put into the spreadsheets. But they, when, when they were asked to take on this task, they, they did it. They learned it and they were doing it. We just thought that the time spent for them would be better spent doing what they're best at, investigations. So we were fortunate enough to know that Brenda Craig, who was the finance manager, had retired and we were able to hire her on an hourly basis to, to do those, those financial calculations, which he's really good at them. She's, you know, a master at her craft. Unfortunately, we, we lost Joey Delos Reyes, investigator Joey Delos Reyes last year in November. He was a, a great person, a great investigator, hard worker. He, I've learned a lot from him. His experience with doing fraud investigations and as a commander for the DA investigators in Ventura, he brought a lot of experience to our office. Uh, and I can safely say the team and I, we learned a lot of the way he methodically investigated these cases. He built a lot of relationships in the community. Uh, a lot of people that I spoke with are very fond of speaking with him. He, he, he made these relationships with, with management companies who would, who would tell them, hey, look, we have 
four more properties that we manage in. Can you do those too? And he read, yeah, I'll take, I'll take care of him. He was a, he was a, a really great person. Uh, even when he was hospitalized, he was still trying to take care of his cases, which is, it shows his commitment to this program and, and to the city. And it was an honor to have him as part of our team and he is be sorely missed. Next. So as I said uh, earlier, we did uh, create a hotline and a uh, online forum, which the number is on the screen. If, if members from the community wish to call a complaint regarding a short-term rental or possible short rental in, in their neighborhood, the number is up there as well as the online forum. It is on our um, city attorney webpage. They can fill out the form and, and we can, uh, it will come to me and then it gets assigned to an investigator to be investigated. The new law that we just discovered a few months ago uh, is uh, 28.86.040, which states that um, any property, any parcel that has an ADU or junior ADU uh, cannot be rented as a short-term rental, and that includes the primary residence on that parcel. Uh, this was approved by the Coastal Commission, so it will affect properties in the coastal zone. Uh, it is something that we've learned about two months ago. And it's something that we are looking into identifying properties that have ADUs and junior ADUs. And we are discussing within our office of how is it that we're going to address this new, address and apply this new law. The challenge that we have doing short-term rent investigations, um, these are very complex investigations. Uh, it, 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 you know, sometimes they, the, the main thing is finding the responsible party. We have found that um, at times a property owner will lease their property to a, a host, and that host will lease several properties and, and manage them all as short-term rentals. So finding the responsible party at times is, is difficult. Uh, finding a good contact, contact number or email address is difficult. Still, numbers are very hard to locate, even with our databases, but we managed to be able to contact them and have the various ways of getting a hold of the property owners. Uh, some of these short-term rentals are owned by liability companies that are owned by another liability company that are owned by another li uh, liability company, and some of those are out of state. So tracking down the, 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 the proper owner is, is, has been difficult. Uh, one thing, one of the cases we run into was that one of the a major chain hotel was renting a short-term rental through, through their members, and they, were, and they were painted by a point system. So the members were either from an exclusive group within the hotel group, and by point system, they were able to rent a short-term rental anywhere in, in California that we know of, and one of those was here in the city. Uh, fortunately, uh, yes, one of Sam's cases, he built a good relationship with the property owner, and with the assistance of Denny and Sarah, we were able to resolve that and get, get that property out of being a short-term rental. It was an in inland to begin with, so we were very successful, successful in getting that property back into the, uh, into the market. And then we also discovered that direct bookings with the host or property owner, we received a call from a person who rented a short-term rent in our city, and the way he did it, he called the property owner and says, hey, I'm going to be here for a week, and they were able to rent it. Uh, cases like those are very challenging. If the person who rented the property didn't contact us, it makes it a lot difficult for us to be able to enforce. So those are some of the difficulties we have found with, with short-term rentals. One item I need to point out on that is that uh, going out into these houses and knocking on the door and talking to not only the renters but neighbors has been very helpful and we got a lot of information by doing that. Uh, and then we're going to go to revenues and co uh, collected and expenses. Uh, so, so far in the coastal zone we've recovered $362,190 in past taxes, uh, interest, penalties, fees and, revenue, and other revenues. And the inland zone is $233,607 to a grand total of five ninety five seventy seven nine seven, which it gets changed every, every week. Every week we're getting, so this is what we had when we submitted the uh, presentation a week ago. As far as expenses, uh, at Rentalscape, we, we are at $26,000 in change. Hourly staff um, is $55,357. Regular employees, which is employees from our office, um, is $12,000. And miscellaneous equipment was $8,866, with a grand total of $102,540. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is that a lot of the equipment and that, we, that we use for the program, uh, you know, I asked to borrow it. I, I asked IT to borrow monitors. I asked IT to borrow desktops. I, had the, uh, I asked the uh, communications department we can have uh, the phones because uh, we thought the program would just be for 12 months. So any place that we can find, we can save money, we did. And it's because we wanted to make sure that the money that we had allocated was for the investigation of the short-term rentals. Uh, as well as that uh, attorney time was not built against the program, meaning Denny's time, Sarah's, John's, any of the attorneys that 
work in our office that help with the program, that their time was not billed against, against the program. And I have to add that uh, several departments have been key in the success of the program so far. Uh, planning department has been giving us help with identifying properties, if they, if, you know, locating uh, property owners, and then they're going to be helping us out identify ADUs and junior ADUs on the properties. Um, finance department has been, has been great by helping us uh, figure out if the property has been paid uh, past due taxes and, you know, if they have a business license. So a lot of departments within the city have contributed to help us with this program. It hasn't just been our office. And their time and the expenditures that the departments have incurred for this is not reflected on this. So I just want to be clear about that. Next slide. And then the allocation of the revenue that's been collected, 74% of the money that we've collected has gone to the general fund. 11% has been gone to TBID and 15% uh, has gone to the Creeks. Uh, moving forward, we're not asking for any additional funding. Uh, we are recommending that council extends the program into the next fiscal year. And then uh, that funding that we have will be used to uh, enforce in the 1147 short term rentals that are still there. And as the picture illustrates, uh, short term rental enforcement is something that is, uh, we, we're taking a steady pace at it. It's, it's hard and it's, and it's and, you know, they're difficult cases, they're complex in their own little way. But as a team, we're all doing our best to get this, get this rock moving and over this hill. So with your help, we're hoping that it, we can continue on with this, with this battle. Uh, so we're open for questions and any comments. All right, I forget I wasn't aware there was more than one Sisyphus, but uh, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to point out that you, you'll see that the numbers in the PowerPoint is different from the number from the, on the CAR. And the reason for that is we've collected more money since the CAR was submitted. So you'll see an increase. And in fact, one of the cases, um, there was a, a large payment. And that's why it's, it's now almost $600,000 as opposed to the 500000 that we reported in the CAR. So that's, that's why there's a difference in the numbers. It's just that th there's progress going on. And of course, you know, and during that time, more money was collected. All right. Thank you. With that, we'll uh, come to council for questions. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Mr. Alba. Um, could you just really briefly... I could do this, but could you do it? Um, talk about the challenge of the investigation. So the public thinks you just look at it on a website and you say, bingo, we got them. And I know there's many more steps that actually you have to do physically, get out somewhere, interview. That kind of, could you just briefly talk about that and, and, and why we have to do that as a step of taking it to the next level? Of course, Councilmember Jordan. So when we receive uh, a, a complaint from a short-term rental, either by complaint or from the rental scape, the investigators still have to verify the information. And the reason why we have to verify it, if the case does go into a, a, a review filing, uh, we have to make sure the information we have is correct. You know, there have been uh, two occasions where the information we received was not correct. It wasn't a short-term rental. Uh, another reason is that, so when we get that complaint, we have to verify a lot of things. One, that it is a short-term rental, that the uh, property owner is part, that knows that this is going on. We, we found cases where uh, there was a personal lease in the property. The property owner had no idea that the short-term rental activity was happening. So we have to ensure that the person we are going to ask to stop is actually the property owner. Like I, said, like I said, we have found out that tenants have been the ones that are renting either a room, two rooms, or the entire house as a short-term rental unbeknownst to the property owner. Um, so some of the steps they have to do is verify who is the responsible party. It might be the owner, it might be the tenant, or it might be a, a host, or something that we call a super host, which is a person that rents multiple properties as a, as a business. Uh, uh, they have to find out who the person is. They have to find a contact information for that property owner, host, or responsible party. Uh, and then after doing that, they have, to find, they have to check with the finance department to see if there's a business tax certificate on file. If there is, uh, when did they pay? Is it specifically for short-term rentals? If there's not, they make a notation on that. Have they been paying any transient occupation taxes in the past? And if they did, what was the amount and the range that they did? And then once they do all that, that's when they actually call the person that's responsible. And then they, they try to explain the reason why the contact they're being called. If it's in inland, they, they explain the zoning ordinance or the zoning zone uh, uh, that's uh, applicable to their area and the financial responsibilities for running a short-term rental. If it's in the coastal zone, we focus mainly on the financial aspect of paying past due uh, business taxes and TOTs. So, thanks. Yep. 
It's definitely not a sit at a desk job, right? You're no, right. it's not. And right. a lot of the times when they can't get a hold of the property owner, what the investors do is that they go to the property, they right. knock on the door, leave a business card, they talk to the neighbors to find out if the neighbors know who the owners are and if they have a contact number, and, and all of that takes a, a lot of time. Right. And if we go to our property and find out there's any code violations regarding billing and safety or whatnot, we contact the billing department and notify them so they can initiate an investigation regarding the violations we observe. Thanks. And then um, I'm kind of just following your slides. Um, you said that from the start, your main priority has been complaint-based. And I'm wondering why that is and if, if that's truly correct because um, the, the evidential base from a layman's perspective is you can just go to a platform website and see them and like on your scattershot slide. You can see them everywhere. And so aren't we also pursuing that as vigorously as we are complaint-based? We are, and the reason I say we're, our, our, our focus is on, on complaint-based is because it's really, that, those type of, of short-term rentals are really affecting that, the neighborhood. Okay. They're, they're active, they're, they're causing a disturbance, uh, either it's in the inland or, or, or close to so on, and it's something that someone's being affected by it. We understand that they, some of the complaints they had filed had been filed for like a year or so ago, and they're, they, want, they want help. They want the city to do something. So we felt, I felt that it was best to uh, try to address those at the same time they were addressing the other ones. But obviously this is affecting the community as, as more. There's, there's, it's affecting someone's well-being and quality of life. And I think that's essential for us to address. That's so what, what, That's a great talking point. I'm going to yeah. save that one for myself. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what happened was when, when the program started, it, it, it launched on August 1st. And all these complaints started coming in. So William and his team was tasked with, okay, we're, we're starting and we have these complaints coming in, so we have to address these complaints. So that's why the complaints were the ones that started first. But once they started getting a handle on all the complaints, okay, we're, we're, we're doing the complaints, but we're gonna start doing proactive enforcement. Right. And that's why you're seeing proactive enforcement yep. numbers. They're lower now than the complaint numbers because in the beginning we, we had to address those complaints first because they were coming in. But it's now to a stage where not only are we taking complaints, but we're also the, the, the team is also proactively looking for um, properties as well. So it's, it, you know, a, as this program goes along, it, we, we anticipate that there's going to be a lot more proactive enforcement. But okay. it, just in the beginning when it started, all these complaints were coming in and we, we wanted to address them. And that's why. Convince me. It was a great talking point. I'll use that as a narrative. So um, on that scattershot um, graph, <laughs> I'm gonna have to stop saying it's all in uh, all in the Mesa, because uh, it's not. I'm a little shocked. Uh, there's so many blue dots there. Do you know? Do we know how many are permitted currently properly inland? Inland, we have approximately 16 that are permitted. 16. 16. Yes. Okay. And we have all those blue dots. that number more than 16, right? Correct. Okay. And then in the coastal use, zone, we have three that are permitted. Yeah, and I don't want to use the word permitted in the coastal zone because I know that's not true. But do we have a number that are operating according to the current city policy, policies or procedures in the coastal zone? I, I'm sorry, I don't. I, I I apologize. I'm not understanding the question. So I, I know we don't permit them in the coastal zone per se, like we permit them inland. Right. It depends. There, there are areas in the, in the, in the coastal zone that you, you, you can't get a permit and there's, okay. th there's, three, so, there's three properties. But yeah, you're, you're right. So well, I didn't want to make the mistake of using the word permitted, but I'll use it. Can you okay. tell me how many that are actually permitted okay. by the broad, broad meaning of that word in the y coastal yes. zone? Uh, yes, three. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, yeah. Council Member Jordan, I think what you're asking is how many in the coastal zone are paying TOT and have the business license? That would, that would probably be right. Correct? Uh, uh, well, there's three that are, in a, your term, broadly permitted. Okay. But there are people in the coastal zone, because of the cracky decision, Correct. that are paying TOTs and remitting transient, uh, remitting transient occupancy taxes and um, obtaining business tax certificates. So, so we, we do have a, 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 a number of those as well. So what do you think that number total is, give or uh, take? Um, I, I, over a hundred, a hundred really? something, okay. yeah. It's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I just have one more. Um, other cities that I know of uh, have offered a percentage of the initial take 
so the penalties or taxes as um, a way to defer costs to the city. So the, you know, it would be like working on a commission. So the better you do at finding those that are not in compliance and bring them through the process and you make your $500,000, 10 or 15 or 20 percent of that goes to the people who are doing the work. Is, uh, was that considered as a way to either accelerate the results or get more resources and why not? No, because one of the potential penalties for not complying is is a is a potential prosecution in court, okay. and a potential criminal prosecution. So we didn't want to put any monetary incentives for anyone to do that. We want them to look at the evidence, be a good investigator, call fouls, call strikes when they're fouls. I mean, call strikes when they're strikes, and call fouls when they're fouls. I'm not yep. quoting Yogi Berra very well, and. And do it right. I mean, we only want to go after people that are in violation of the ordinance. We don't want the investigators to have any type of financial gain in it. And we, we wouldn't want that in okay. any type of enforcement. We want to be fair and we want them to, to make the right calls. That's what's important to us. Fair enough. Thank you both. Thank you. Mr. Friedman. Uh, thank you. I just have a, a few questions. If you could pull up slide seven uh, for me. Oh, sure. Yes. OK. Um, that. How do I go back? There you go, like that. So that's a, a lot of STRs uh, if you're counting the blue and the gray. So my, my question is on, in particular on some of the gray items, would those houses, would, would those be cases that somebody might live in the home and have gone on, say, their own vacation for a few weeks and rented it out, uh, like one time or... Um, are, are those just strictly all the time vacation rentals? What we found out from our investigations thus far is that a lot of the short-term rentals that we've investigated are an investment house. It's a house that they have, they purchase it for the purposes of short-term rental, and then you know it's a, an investment. Okay. So these are mostly investment properties, they're not someone who's trying to supplement their income, like a teacher or something who might have the summers off or something like that? No. Okay. Uh, if you could go to slide 12. So I was interested in this. Uh, the, the question I have here is the 31 days in this in this new law. Um, I've heard that um, anecdotally that some of the, these companies that rent them out, what they'll do is to, to try to get around our ordinances. They'll say, well, if you come in and you rent for 30 days, uh, you have to rent it for 30 or 31 days. But if you cancel after just a couple days, there's no penalty. Uh, are you aware, is that happening, and if so, how do we address that? Yeah, uh, the, they, it, they, they, I've had a case, a criminal case, where they tried to make that argument, and that, that argument is inconsistent with our existing law, and we will, we will prosecute them if they rent for less than 30 days. They, it, it, you can say, I'm signing a lease for 30, uh, 31 days, and then say, you can cancel any time, we won't charge you, but once you rent for less than 30 days, you're required to pay, pay business taxes, you're required to permit TOTs, you're required to be in a zone that permits that type of conduct to occur. And so um, in that case, that argument was made, um, that argument was rejected. I made, I stated my position and the person stopped their short-term rental and then remitted the back taxes. Great, so that was yeah. happening but when, and it took place and we are addressing, it. that's good. Yes, to yes, I, I think that was happening before. Uh, we ha I haven't seen that since. I mean, I think um, that, that case was before the pilot program. So um, I, I certainly haven't seen it since the pilot program or seen a resurgence of that argument in the case I prosecuted. And um, from talking to William or any of the cases that we've in investigated, have they attempted to do that? But I, I have heard of that, and I did have one case with that scenario, yes. So, so if that does happen, we are able to address it, and we are. Uh, yes, absolutely. Just two more questions. If you go next slide, uh, slide 13. And um, one of the questions I had is with this slide, it talks about, uh, it's the, the third bullet point there, hotels renting uh, vacation members using points. Um, there is, uh, there's a website out there where an actual hotel chain has purchased houses, I think, and they're using them as vacation rentals. So is this a case where they're just renting them, they just find a way to rent them out 
using points or um, or if they actually purchase a house for their membership and use the points, um, are they di are those different scenarios and can we go after both cases? Uh, they're, they're different scenarios and the, in regards to whether or not we can go after both cases, the, the, it depends on the first case. Um, if, if, if Council Member Friedman, you're thinking about like the Picasso, um, uh, or is that something different? No, it's not Picasso okay. or it's okay. ownership. It's, it's, yeah. it's a major hotel chain uh, from, uh, I've seen it online and there's others where they've gone out and they've actually bought homes and then yes. what they've done, what they're doing is then using those homes and advertising them to their membership rewards. So you can come into Santa Barbara and stay in this home for a week using points. Yeah, there, there's no, yeah, we enforce on those. And in fact, in, 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 the, in the case that William was talking about, we did enforce on them. And also we, we require that they remit TOTs. And so we, we found a way to find a, a fair method in remitting TOTs when they're dealing with points. So yeah, it, it doesn't matter if they're a corporation or an, an LLC or an LLC owned by an LLC or an LLC. It, it, it doesn't matter to us. It, it, you, you can't, you know, all, the law's applicable to everyone. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So um, I might talk with you offline just about of this course. one case in particular because they own multiple homes um, in the South Coast, not all in Santa Barbara, but others where they purchased the homes, at least as I understand it maybe. But, um, but yeah, I'm glad that we can address that if they purchase, if they purchase the homes and then start renting them out on their, their own through rewards. Yes. Um, slide 14, my last question. Um, just want to understand that I, I understand this right is we have approximately 151 cases, not all of them panned out, but in those 151 or 150 so cases produced 600,000 in revenue? Um, actually, less than that because some are still pending investigation. So y yes, um, it, it, the, the cases that we have now it, it are, are what produce this, this revenue. And so if we have another 1,100 or so or 1,000 so cases, I mean, we can't predict how much revenue, but there's significant back that's owed because if this is just, you know, 100 so of these, that there could be significant additional revenue as we go through the program to help sustain it that, that's out there. Council Member Jordan, uh, the amount of money that would be covered for that $595,000 is approximately 40 properties. So, wow. so, there's, so there's a lot more to, to go for enforcement and potential revenue. Correct. Okay, thank you. And the revenue part of it really is a, by, it's a byproduct of, so what our goal is to, to get, get them to comply. And of course, one of the things they need to do is pay their taxes. Everyone has to pay their taxes. So this is kind of a, we weren't out there just trying to seek as much revenue as possible. We want them to pay what they owed. And these, this is taxpayer money. So we emphasize the fact that they have to pay what, they're, what they owed. But this is, the, this is a byproduct of us taking enforcement action. And this would be one, one time on, especially those that get shut down, this is one time it wouldn't be an ongoing no, because Correct. they need to stop. Because if they start it up again, and Rentalscape can tell us, and, they, and the investigators are actively looking for things, it, it, it'll result in another case. Thank you. Ms. Snedden. Thank you, Mayor Rouse. Um, it's just incredible what you've been able to identify so far. That map seven on slide seven is stunning. Um, not in a good way. It is gratifying to see that properties that I've been worried about in my neighborhood are already identified on there, so that's actually really helpful to see. Um, and I'm wondering, I have two questions. One, if you think a general rental registry throughout the city might be helpful in your efforts, if anybody who's renting a property for any type of use, if it was registered, would that help you? Well. Yeah. Um, it, one of the things that the investigators have to do is find out who the owner is. So <clears throat> if there's, right now what they do is they, they use whatever resource they have. And one of the things, one of the people we need to thank is the county. <laughs> they gave us access so that we can go online. The investigators can go online and look at the deeds and stuff. And then they also have other tools that they can use to try to find the identity of people. So. That's one of the difficulties in, in enforcement. So if there's a registry, that is another tool that could be out there mm -hmm. um, that the investors, investigators may possibly be able to use. Thank you. And then the recommendation is to extend this program for just another year. And I'm wondering, it seems so successful, why is the recommendation not to 
just make this a program now? And is that an option today to just have this move forward? Right now, the re so um, you you have you you have the right to the council has the right to to do that, and that's something we're going to do whatever the council uh, wants done. So we, we we didn't know what the appetite was if you want to give the city attorney's office a recurring budget every year for the program or how that worked out. We do know that we were judicious in how we spent the money, that there were, there's about a million dollars left over, and that um, if you want us to, we're gonna, and, and we're not asking for any more funds, we'll take that money and, and try to do as much of that one, over 1,000 cases that we can with the great investigative team that we have now. So that was our mind set. Um, I know there was a lot of discussions internally on, 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 on what to propose and we were just trying to find something where, we, you know, what do we do? Do, do, do? But at the end of the day, council can decide what is best and we will always do what council determines is best. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Senate, if I could just chime in on that too a little bit. Um, as you know, this was created as a pilot program for one year, and if we did it for, and we're asking to extend it for another year because we just started it rolling out in August, um, and you know we 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 sincerely want to keep it another year. We could keep it another five years in order to expend the the budget that was um, granted to this program easily because we're you know as you can see we're really being judicious about the expenses. Um, if we did extend it longer than another fiscal year, then it would probably not be a pilot program. It would be a regular program, which would be fine. It's just really a budgeting, as Keith will tell you. He doesn't like doing that carryover, so we would rather make it into a permanent program, which would be completely fine, absolutely fine with the attorney's office. It's really up to you. Thank you. Thank I'd you. like to make it a permanent program, so that answers that question. Thank you. Ms. Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, let's see. How many of the properties that um, you have had contact with the property owners have actually said, okay, I learned my lesson and then turned their short-term rent rent property into like long-term, like it's back in the market for somebody to rent it out? I, and this might be, I know that you might not have the answer, but. I, I, I think, um Ultimately, uh, every case that we determined there was a violation, we're able to gain compliance. Um, I think two thirds of it do it voluntarily um, right now, just based on the numbers we have, and a third of it requires me to take action. And so, um, whether they put it long term or not, um, some do. Um, others we know take it off the short term market, but we don't know what what they do with it. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that some people have vacation homes and they were looking to make money in the times that they're not staying in their vacation home. So they just had to stop. Um, but I, I do know that there, there, there are cases like that. But there are cases where they put long-term as well. And there are cases where they put long-term as vacation rentals, where they change the ad to require the stay to be more than 30, 30 days. And then um, my follow-up question, for the new law that just um, came through with the ADUs, let's say um, a retired you know, couple that were teachers and, well, maybe not teachers are not a good example, but a retired couple and their kids are off to college and they have an ADU, um, so they wouldn't be able to rent that out even though they live in the property, right, just to be clear? C correct. Okay. The, um, both inland and coastal zone has this has an ordinance. Um, the the one in the coastal zone, there was um, a submittal for a change of the LCP to the coastal commission. There was there there was a determination that it was exempt. The coastal commission reviewed that and determined that it it, it was a de minimis um, um, change to the LCP. So um, once that was done, then We've complied with the Coastal Act, and um, it, any any property with an ADU or JADU, they can't rent it short term, even in the main primary property. So, looking into the future, and you know, 
community members already know that this program is, you know, there's a pilot program and there is investigators out there, because I've heard a lot of complaints, um, but I'm really glad that this presentation we're having today, and thank you again. Thinking long term for, could you explain to the public how your enforcement team works with the enforcement team we have under planning? Because I know those folks, they, they go out there when there's also complaints and it's, they're, they're mainly, um, their purpose is for like illegal building. Um, could you explain to the public how both teams work together? And if we go into like a five-year program, I just, I've heard a lot of uh, complaints about money and coming out of the general fund and us not have, being in a position where to fund another program. So if you could just explain to the public how both teams work together. Sure, yes. I can answer that. Councilmember Alejandro Gutierrez. So when we receive a complaint of a short-term rental and the investigators arrive at the property, we you know, speak with the property owner, we ask permission to look at the property, and if we do find a violation, either uh, an illegal converter shed that's been used as a short-term rental, our team takes action on the short-term rental aspect of it, we communicate with uh, the code enforcement supervisor in regards to the violation that we observe. They set up an, uh, an inspection date to go in, 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 uh, and speak with the property owner and address those, those code violations. And once they're in the property, my understanding is that they review the property or inspect it to see if there's any additional uh, violations that need to be addressed at the time. So the community is actually getting a benefit where we are cracking down on the short-term, illegal short-term rentals, and we're making sure that our housing stock is properly like it's safe right yes uh, okay. uh, yes I, I, I've been doing court enforcement uh, enforcement helping the court enforcement staff for the past years that I've been here so I've learned a lot of the code violations uh, setback settings um, converted uh, illegal converted garages electrical problems and whatnot so the ability to work hand in hand with our court enforcement has been very beneficial and it's beneficial to the community thank you mr. Gutierrez thank you mr. mayor um, did, did you cover whether or not there was any violations of people who had RVs on their property that they were renting out as Airbnbs? Council Member Gutierrez, uh, we have not uh, had a complaint as such, but if we did run to a complaint where a RV was being used as a short-term rental, we would address it. We did get a complaint of a area that was being used as a, they were renting a uh, uh, tents as a short-term rental and we've investigated and, ha and the property has been very compliant with it so yes if we anything that they're being used as a short-term rental either a shed we had a situation where there was a shed that was converted uh, a utility shed that was converted into a short-term rental we addressed that as a short-term rental and building uh, code enforcement came in and addressed the uh, modifications to the shed because they had a, a shower and a kitchen installed in it so but building safety do investigate about RVs and stuff, and uh, there have been cases where the, um, there was rentals of RVs, but it wasn't a short-term rental case. But that 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 uh, building and safety, their code compliance has. So as of now, there's been no official complaint or uh, ask for an investigation of an RV being used as that. I, I, I do understand. I do know there was a complaint of an RV being used as a long-term rental. I, I did see that complaint. It was shared with me by the code of compliance supervisor. In my understanding, they are investigating it. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Very good. We have uh, no in-person request of speakers. Is anyone online to speak on this item, Madam Clerk? No, Mr. Mayor. All right. Very good. With that, we'll come back to uh, council for questions. Mr. Friedman, or for comments. Mr. Friedman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so first, I just, I know you're all expecting a quote, but I don't have one. Instead, I'd like to take a picture of you to upload it to Wikipedia and say definition of success. Oh, okay. So uh, no, seriously, though, a program, uh, I remember when we started this uh, about a year ago, we were expecting the cost to be significantly higher and the revenue to be lower. And I was like, well, why are you going to spend a million dollars to collect 500000 in revenue? And that's what made the uh, the media and and a lot of the public, but the reason was we didn't know how much the program was gonna cost or the revenue came in, and it turns out, thanks to you and your team, uh, that we kept the cost minimal and the revenue exceeded what we had thought. And so I, I really appreciate you uh, just being effective with the dollars that you had and the time that you spent using uh, 
retired law enforcement was great because they already have access to our system, a low-cost vendor. You really thought of everything on the expenditure side and the process side. So um, and it's led to outstanding results uh, for enforcement and getting the back taxes and others that are out there. Um, I also wanted to say that I um, support moving forward as part of the budget process uh, to Ms. Connect and the team if you could come back uh, with a recommendation in there on what it would take to make this permanent as part of that. I think um, that's fully appropriate for us to have that discussion. I'm like with Council Member Sneddon. Uh, say, why, why stop now when we still have a vast majority of them that are out there? We know they're there uh, just to continue it, and it's not going to be solved in one year, uh, obviously, with that many that are out there. And then, um, and then just the number of complaints that are out there, you can see it's throughout the city. I've uh, received a number in the 5th District, especially the coastal area. So um, it's just a way to, once again, say we are addressing it, and I appreciate all that you did, this is an outstanding success and look forward to uh, keeping this going and uh, making sure that the law is complied with and um, really impacting what, um, our housing stock. That's what's taking place. So hopefully we'll be able to address that on the supply side. Of a, it's a larger discussion for another time. Thank you. Ms. Sned. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Rouse. And um, again, echoing the comments of Council Member Friedman, really successful and that you were able to do it at such a low cost is um, really incredible. And just the map alone, that being a, a byproduct or a product of the work that you've been doing really gives us an idea of how extensive this issue is and that over a thousand still needing to be investigated. Um, so I would very much like this uh, pilot to become a program and I think it is appropriate in the budget um, deliberations, discussions to extend that, but it, I, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't want to carry forward the success. And then I think um, really want to um, maybe get some feedback on whether a rental registry um, would aid in these efforts. I'm, I'm very supportive of a rental registry for multiple other reasons, but it does seem to me that if people did have to declare how they were using their properties for rentals, that that would add a layer of not just waiting to be found out, but needing to proactively declare um, how they're using it. So as part of this discussion, and I'm not sure if that's for this item or for item 10 that is still coming up, but I will keep mentioning that. And um, really thank you for your efforts. And your investigators too, thank you for your efforts. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll just echo what you've heard already um, in terms of success and the job you've done. In particular, um, Mr. Way, I want to thank you for every time something comes up uh, that sounds like enforcement, that you're on the mic immediately to talk about we're not here to collect dollars from people. We're here to stop the problem. Because um, uh, I know the reputation precedes all of us. Um, out there, and uh, I, I thank you for, for, for carrying that torch and making it plain. And I have a suggestion on that slide, too, is that you train us, too, and get the revenues off the top and start saying maybe collections and train us to say back taxes, interest, penalties, and fees, and not revenues. So we just don't fall into that trap that we're only, all we're doing is out there chasing revenues. No, these, these operations owe the community money. We're not chasing new revenues. So. Um, I would also support um, uh, moving it to either a permanent or you tell us when you need to stop it because we've whittled it down. Um, and if it doesn't go without saying, uh, I like this format of an annual report also to hear what's going on. So if that would be included in where this ends up to going, just going on and chasing, uh, chasing down the, the, the 1,100 of them and uh, having an annual report. That, uh, that scattershot is a, a slap the head for me because I would have insisted before I saw that that uh, the problem's really a coastal problem and the problem's as much a inland problem as it is a coastal problem and I never would have believed that till I saw that graph. So um, there's plenty of work to do. So thank you again and thank you again to your team. Ms. Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wasn't going to say anything because my colleagues did a great job um, in their comments, but I, I do want to recognize the team because when we, I, I was in the finance committee when we said, yes, let's do it. And the, a lot of 
community members uh, were not very happy and I, like you, through this process, received a lot of emails <laughs> and it just seemed, it was like torture to get some property owners to understand what we were doing. And to hear this report and to see how you built such a great team and I just want to thank um, the investigators for all your work and um, Santa Barbara is a community that is very sensitive, <laughs> so thank you for all that community outreach you did and thank you. All right, very good. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to be in favor of extending the this, this situation. I know that expense-wise, and the low-hanging fruit comes first, and I'm sure the expense versus revenue side is going to change dramatically in the next year. So I'm glad we have a cushion because it's going to get the ones are going to get harder and harder and more expensive to do, and you're not even assigning any of your own time to this budget. So that'll be a discussion for later on. With that, though, I would entertain a motion on the item. Ms. Snedden. Um, thank you, Mayor Rouse. Um, I would uh, move staff recommendation to extend the pilot another year with the comment that um, there's will to extend it beyond that through the budget process. Okay, I'll motion by Snedden. Second. second by Friedman. Any further discussion? May we have the vote, please, Madam Clerk. This is a motion by Councilmember Snedden, seconded by Councilmember Friedman, for the staff recommendation with um, a description of the will to extend beyond that one year in the budget process. Okay. Okay, pass unanimously with all present, uh, Maiden Harbin being absent. Very good. Move on to the next item. Thank you very much for the report. And uh, would you read that item, Madam Clerk? Yes, next item is item 10, request from Mayor Pro Tempore Mike Jordan and Councilmember Eric Friedman to agendize discussion on short-term vacation rental regulations. Very good, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, much of this groundwork has been done on the prior item. Um, uh, our uh, request uh, stems around the uh, relatively uncontrolled growth of short-term vacation rentals over the last, uh, let's call it decade. And my notes uh, prior to this would have said, uh, particularly in the coastal zone, but I sound a little corrected today. I'm a little amazed at that. Um, and that um, that growth has led to uh, significant impacts on both uh, the reduction of our residential housing stock and uh, significant negative disruptions to what are historical and zoned single family residence zones. So our ask is for approval from council for an agendized item uh, on June 11th, if that continues to work, uh, to review briefly where and how we allow them and then discuss any changes uh, to those current procedures or policies in either or both the inland or coastal zones. Very good, Mr. Friedman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have much else to add. Um, that last item showed that there are a number of, of rentals out there uh, and we just want to have that conversation. Are our current policies and ordinances uh, effective in managing uh, this, this issue? Uh, how does that relate in the coastal zone with uh, coastal access? So uh, bringing that back uh, on June 11th to get the information of what we're doing and then at that time get further council direction and clarification for the future would be an appropriate way to uh, address uh, this issue and make improvements to um, to the housing stock, but also in terms of the, the um, short-term vacation rentals as they currently stand. So um, that's the ask. Thank you. All right, very good. So it's not an item for discussion, rather just if we're going to put it on the agenda at the appropriate time. Ms. Snedden. Thank you, Mayor Ross. I'm completely supportive of the ask and would like to add that that might be an appropriate time to look at um, a rental registry and if it could be helpful to that. Uh, so just, Madam if, Attorney, is that something uh, within the scope of that? I mean, that's, that wasn't the bright item brought forward, so I didn't know. Uh, Mayor Rouse and Council Member Snedden, uh, it's not necessarily a part of a motion. You'll just be accepting the 
mm -hmm. put it on and um, Except staff can ask to yeah, we, agenda. Yeah, we can look okay. at that as part of a program. If that's Very it's, good. It's a request that it would be helpful to have that information during that discussion, um, just as a comment. Okay. Uh, Oh. Mr. Mayor, if I could just add one comment that when we do, if, if the council votes, majority vote to, to agendize this for June 11th, um, what we will be presenting, what staff will be presenting will be an overview of what the existing laws are with regard to short-term vacation rentals, it, both in the coastal zone and in the inland area. And then we will be looking for, for council input to staff on what staff, what they're requesting staff bring back in terms of suggested ordinance amendments. And, you know, we would then bring back an analysis of what it would, what it would take to make those ordinance amendments, what the enforcement obligations would be, what the, the um, you know, the, the whole kind of programmatic elements with regard to what that would entail. So it's going to be a series of, Mm -hmm. of council actions and council agendized uh, meetings after that, it won't all come back to you on June 11th. So this would just be the beginning of, you know, wh how I would see it, this would just be the first step in that process. So on June 11th, we're going to be asking council to give us their ideas on what they would like us to bring back at Great. a later date. Thank you for the clarification. That's a, we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Or else, have we opened public comment? Oh, public comment on that? Is there anybody? If there's nothing in, in the house. Are we? Mr. Mayor, no public comment okay, on that. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Very good. Um, move the recommendation. Is there a second? Second by Alejandro Gutierrez. Very good. Everybody understand the motion? May we have the vote, please? Motion by Councilmember Snedden, seconded by Councilmember Alejandro Gutierrez for the recommended action. Go ahead and vote, please. Thank you very much. Votes is unanimously with all present. Megan Harmon absent. Very good. Would you read the next item, please, Madam Clerk? Yes, item 11, initiation of proceedings under Santa Barbara Municipal Code Chapter 4.45 to establish the Downtown Community Benefit Improvement District Resolution. Recommendation Council A, direct the city administrator to sign the petitions of city-owned properties within the proposed Downtown Community Benefit Improvement District, Downtown Seabid. B, adopt by, tiding, adopt by reading of title only. A resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara declaring its intention to establish the Downtown Community Benefit Improvement District pursuant to Chapter 4.45 of the Santa Barbara Municipal Code. And C, set a date for a public hearing on June 25th, 2024. Thank you. Mr. Baudet. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, good afternoon. Um, I'm Brandon Baudet, uh, Acting Library Director. However, I'm today I'm here in my prior role with the City Administrator's Office. Um, I'm excited to bring this item before you. This is a proposed Community Benefit Improvement District, or a CBID, in the downtown Santa Barbara area. So just a little background first. In 2021, Chapter 4.45 of the Santa Barbara Municipal Code was adopted by Council to facilitate the formation of a CBID and establish a procedure for property owners to petition to fund special services through a special benefit assessment on their property. This also sets a threshold of 30% assessment value to initiate a ballot process. The proposed CBID arose out of the combined efforts of the Downtown Santa Barbara, the Santa Barbara South Coast Regional Chamber of Commerce, and the CBID Steering Committee made up of various key stakeholders in downtown. Uh, in, New, in New City America, a consultant that specializes in CBIDs were, were hired in 2022. A survey was sent out to all the property owners in the proposed CBID area to ascertain their level of conceptual support for the services that would be funded through the establishment of a new downtown Santa Barbara CBID. Based upon these results, the downtown Santa Barbara CBID steering committee determined there was enough support to produce a preliminary management district plan that would outline the district, assessment, and priority setting for the use of these funds. So what is a CBID? A CBID is a property owner's vote to assess themselves to pull financial resources that pays for district-wide activities. This is a public-private partnership where funds supplement and act independently of general benefit services provided by the city. CBIDs are actually very common. There's hundreds of them in, the, in California. 
Uh, regionally, there are downtown CBIDs in uh, Ventura and Oxnard. And most recently, Coast Village Road uh, formed theirs in 2022. The proposed downtown Santa Barbara CBIT consists of approximately 543 parcels with two benefit zones. The core area in the blue shaded area is the, spans the southern side of Sola Street to the northern side of Highway 101 and the eastern side of Chapala Street to the west side of Anacapa Street. Zone 2, kind of reflected by that red dotted line, is, spans the east side of Anacapa Street down from Sola to Highway 101. The primary core area of the zone one uh, has an assessment based off linear footage, building square footage, and total lot size. Zone two has a slightly less reduced amount as they receive a, a less um, maintenance effort on that side. This reflects a, an, an approximate budget for the first year and how those would be allocated. At just over $2.2 million, the majority of funds would be used to enhance safety cleanliness, beautification, and maintenance of the district. 14% would be used to enhance placemaking identity and improve the image of the district. 15% would use to, be, to administer the bene district benefits, including staff, director salary, and associated costs like liability insurance. And then a small amount of funds would be allocated for contingency reserves. The, the proposed CBID downtown varies slightly from the Coast Village in that the city is a, is a property owner in this district. In fact, it has 26 city properties uh, totaling just over $179,000. The city would be the, the, the major assessment value, so they compromise 8.13% of the total assessment value. Most of these properties rely on the downtown parking program, uh, the parking garages, but also includes City Hall, Korea Rec Center, Central Library, things like that. Uh, all publicly owned and, par and operated parcels will be assessed uh, for linear footage and lot size only as their assessments will be used primarily to fund sidewalks. So the city, the city properties are, have a slightly lower assessment than, than the rest of the properties. There are also city-owned properties that with long-term ground lease agreement, arrangements, uh, such as Pase Nuevo. In that case, the leasee would, would pay the assessment for those. The city will continue to provide general benefit services in downtown Santa Barbara, which will include public safety programs, street sweeping, tree trimming, road repairs, things like that. The frequencies of these general services can be changed upon based on budget constraints. However, the city can't change it with any less frequency than it would anywhere else in the city. So for process-wise, how it would work today is, um, and I'm gonna veer from the slide a little bit because I have updated numbers. So the current petitions in support of the downtown CBID is actually at 29.06% as of this morning. So this falls just short of the 30% threshold to initiate the resolution of intent. However, the city has a 8.13% that they could add by signing the petition to initiate the process. That puts, them at, that puts the total at 37.09% and effectively initiates the balloting process. The city would distribute ballots and, and, and facilitate the ballot process. Um, they would tabulate, collect the, the, the ballots at a public hearing on June 25th. Uh, that there will we'll determine if there's a 50 plus one majority vote and at that point, the city, could, city council could adopt a resolution of levy and effectively form the, the district. Our consultant with New City America, unfortunately, was unable to, to meet with us today. So I've asked Trey Penner from the Coast Village Association to kind of be our subject matter expert. He, he's gonna just talk a little bit about the Coast Village assessment, kind of the values and benefits of it, and also provide a little bit background for you guys in terms of governance of the structure of it. Okay, hey, Mr. Penner. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Uh, it's always a, I always appreciate the opportunity to present and speak before you and the council, and I hope I'm able to provide some insights to this exciting endeavor. Uh, I'm a member of the downtown Santa Barbara Seabid Steering Committee and a manager of real estate assets in the downtown core. And besides the real estate assets, I became involved with the committee as the president of the first ever CBID in Santa Barbara, that of Coast Village Improvement District. 
I'm very pleased to see the enabling ordinance, the, the enabling ordinance that the council created to help establish the CBR CBID is now doing something that we'd hoped it would do, which is to provide a path for additional CBIDs in the city of Santa Barbara, and we thankfully have reached that moment. The Chamber of Commerce and the DO, downtown organization, in a combined effort, help shepherd this process that you may be familiar with. They engaged the same consultant firm of New City America and Marco Lamandri with the primary goal to create the management plan and organize the effort to petition for balloting of the proposed district, which Mr. Burdett just laid out for you. Enhanced services, engagement, focus, and voice. These are some of the great opportunities I have witnessed with the establishment of the Coast Village Road Seabid and what I expect will happen with the downtown CBID. Following an expected successful balloting process in May and June, the newly formed CBID would establish an initial board of directors. This board will have a minimum of two third members as property owners and the balanced community and business members. The initial board will finalize the bylaws and move to place an executive director for the organization. The first tranche of funding would be received by the district in mid-December, and any contracts for services would be established to start January 2025. So we are at a very important inflection point for our downtown, but I expect to be at an even more important inflection point five years from now. As you may recall, and with great wisdom of the council, the enabling ordinance provided for a requirement that the initial term of the district would be for a five-year period and a requirement to reballot after the initial term. This five-year initial term creates the opportunity to establish and create a successful CBID and ensure that the goals and objectives of the CBID have been met to continue beyond the five years. As you know, there are hundreds of successful CBIDs throughout the state of California, helping civil, civic, excuse me, helping civic and commercial areas of the city to be more successful, vibrant, and engaged. And I welcome any questions you may have regarding this effort and the Coast Village CBID. Questions from council. Ms. Snedden. Thank you, Mayor Rouse, and, and thank you, Mr. Pinner, for being here. Um, first question for you, and um, if you could comment on the benefits of you as you've experienced them through the Coast Village CBID, or um, I guess you can't, you're not here to speak on, well, on I can, that. I can comment in on general, that. Right. what would be the benefits to property owners in terms of, you mentioned, enhanced services, engagement, and voice, yep. and just how might that positively impact property owners? Well, I think I'm glad you picked on that because those four areas, and I, I tried to come up with an acronym to change the words around so we can come up with a u word to use all the time, but EEFV didn't come to anything, so I'll work on that. But enhanced services, engagement, focus, and voice. So one thing I think most importantly is voice, although that was the fourth item. I have found through our involvement with the Coast Village Association now a year and a half in that the ability for property owners, business owners, the retailers to get together and feel as if when they come together and speak about an idea and then we can either act on it either physically in the field by doing work or hiring somebody or here at the council or at a civic situation, that has risen exponentially. I think before there's always a feeling of who's really listening to my concerns um, so, and a place for concerned either residents and or property and business owners to come talk to first. Mm -hmm. um, and then having a, an executive director that we have now on Coast Village Road full time to deal with the issues has been a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then I'm not sure if you can comment on this or not, but um, for those who vote, versus those who would vote against. Is there any preference for who would be serving on the board of the entity once it's formed? So I think you're asking me the makeup of the, the board. Yeah. So the initial board is a self-appointed board and it lasts for less than one year until you can have the actual vote of a board through the membership. 
So you can't have a voted board until you have paying members of the district. So to have paying members of the district, you first have to have those tax assessments happen. And I'm speaking now the words of Mark Lamandry. This is not coming from me. He, he told me this many times. That's why you have to have the initial board of directors be self-appointed. And is Still there with the makeup of two-thirds yeah. mm -hmm. property owners. Mm -hmm. And is there any advantage to someone voting yes on, on this as a, to the 50 plus 1 percent in terms of being able to serve on that board or not? No, there's been no um, position or statement made on any board positions. Is that the question I think yeah. you're asking? No, no, there's been no, um, we have no uh, yet uh, outline of the board makeup at this point. Okay. I'll take this opportunity to thank you for leading the way on the template for this type of CBID with the Coast Village efforts. Thank it's, you. It's, uh, I'm, I'm hoping there's another one, and I'll be happy to come speak again about it. All right, very good. Um, I'll ask a question that I've kind of tortured Mr. Baudet with off and on over this entire process. So you've been stuck within a few points of the 30% threshold, and 30% threshold represents a minimum or minority of the of the stakeholders, and now you're right on the you're, you're statistically at thirty percent, but it's so twenty nine point something. All right, what has been the difficulty getting that last couple of percentages? My concern, of course, is do do we really are we really representing the majority of the stakeholders? Getting this to the point where they can even you know forward for a ballot for a vote. So why has this been so difficult to this, get that last increment of, uh, of participation? Mr. Mayor, members of council, I don't, I don't have a, a, a direct answer for that. Um, it's with, with any sort of communication effort, there's kind of an ebb and flow to everything. Um, faces change sometimes, um, but I, 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 there's been a lot of momentum recently within the last several months, especially as the media picked up, where we really saw that percentage increase, um, probably close to over 10% in, in, in that span. So, um, you know, we're at 29.06 as of this morning. Could we hit 30 maybe next week? Probably. Um, but so, who's counting, right? But, okay. But, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Pender, I, have a I can add a comment to that too, and it's, it's an interesting, I think, situation. As uh, as Mr. Baudet mo noted, the city makes up a little over eight percent of the district vote, and they have not yet thrown their hat into the ring. So, in essence, we've actually reached over thirty percent of those who can vote because you have not voted yet. So, if you were to take your eight percent out of the list, we've actually exceeded thirty percent theoretically, because you're not letting us ask those 8% yet to vote because you haven't made that decision. So I hope that it's a little nuanced, but of those property owners that have, have voted, it is more than 30%. We should have you weigh in during our budget deliberations. That'd be I'd be happy fun. to. Fun with numbers. Okay, if there are no further questions, we have some public commenters on this item, and we'll start out with Peter Lewis. And for public commenters, we do have three minutes at the dais, and there's a timer that's right in front of you. Mr. Lewis. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and council members. Um, we are overburdened as local and California taxpayers. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind about this significant challenge, but this is one additional burden I will accept and support. Please note, this is one additional burden. <laughs> uh, the beauty of this effort is it is a five-year term, as they pointed out. And if it's ineffective, we'll jettison it. Uh, the other compelling feature is it's self-inflicted. Only property owners, in pr in private and public, cast ballots on the special assessment fees to support this district. Many of us in this room have spent a couple of years in committee and community outreach to develop consensus on the pressing needs to improve our downtown. This effort was born out of necessity. The status quo is no longer acceptable, an option, or a strategy. A C bid is a proven strategy 
that raises funds through self-imposed assessments by majority vote of all property owners within the district. Once formed, the district creates a nonprofit board to manage the new resources that supplement existing services. This is key. These are supplemental resources. These funds will augment existing services to support a safe, clean, and inviting destination. This is a really critical distinction that we must adhere to. The heart of our city needs some TLC and advocacy to promote a safer, cleaner, and more attractive downtown. All of us want a better downtown. We discuss the problems ad nauseum. Now is the time to invest and support a goal to create a more vibrant community downtown. The CBID is a $2 million annual commitment to contribute to a more vibrant downtown. Thank you for your consideration. Janet Rufus, be followed by Robin Elander. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. My name is Janet Rufus. Um, I serve with Peter Lewis as the co-chair of the CBID for several months now. Um, I don't know that I could say it any better than Peter did. I think he did an excellent job. But I am not a property owner downtown. <clears throat> I am a tenant. And I run a business downtown that relies on the vibrancy of what goes on down there. And um, so really, I'm here to talk about why is this CBID important for our downtown? And I think uh, Mr. Lewis made a pretty compelling argument, but the CBID uh, is really vital to ensure that we have a platform on which to rebuild the economic vitality of our downtown. Um, the assessments of property owners were based on preferences that they told us they wanted. The, the, the way the budget was built was based on the responses from those surveyed uh, in the property district. They told us that these are the things that they wanted and that, that these were the things that were important to them. We do aim to enhance identity and placemaking, making the downtown a more attractive uh, place for the people who live here and for the people who visit us. Uh, I was recently walking um, up State Street uh, and had to ask myself, I'm not sure why our visitors want to walk up and down State Street because it really is it, it's not a compelling place to be anymore. And I think the CBID is a way for us to really help to change that. Establishing a CBID for downtown means self-sufficiency and independence from the flux of city budgets. We were all at Stay the City on Friday, and we know that it's a difficult time. But this gives us some um, self-efficacy. We can manage uh, the downtown and make sure that we're getting what we need to create a space where we can be uh, economically viable. Many interested stakeholders have been participating in this. This is one of the most collaborative committee exercises I've been in in a long time. Um, I think that speaks to the sense of urgency that uh, the stakeholders have around something needing to be done. And so um, I really appreciate your willingness to consider uh, joining us and voting uh, to do this. We think it's really important. And um, as, as Mr. Lewis said, you know, five years from now, we'll all be able to um, uh, pat each other on the back and say what a good idea it was. So I thank you for your consideration today. Thank you, Robin Elander, followed by Jeffrey Carter. Mayor, council members, and members of the public, my name is Robin Elander, and I have the privilege to serve as the executive director for the Downtown Organization of Santa Barbara, and I'm excited to be here at this important milestone for our downtown today. The Downtown CBID Steering Committee, representing diverse downtown property owners, is driving this important initiative. The CBID management plan and its budget are a result of careful consideration representing a significant community effort over several recent years. This plan represents property owners' deep experience and input who have come together to collectively invest in downtown's future through this project. 
The effort also represents the culmination of decades of collective expertise of the Downtown Organization's Board and the deep expertise of the South Coast Chamber of Commerce as well. The proposed CBID outlined uh, here improves significantly on what the existing business-based uh, business license uh, business Improvement District has done over the last 50 years by offering a more stable and adequate funding source, more comprehensive services, and an updated infrastructure to tackle downtown's current and future challenges. The proposed CBID budget outlines specific allocations for the different service areas with the largest portion, 66% of the budget, allocated to safety, cleanliness, beautification, graffiti removal, and maintenance, with the rest going to placemaking, identity, marketing, and administration of the services. These services, as mentioned, are above and beyond what the city currently provides and do not serve as a replacement, but instead a carefully curated, non-duplicative service enhancement. CBIDs across the nation support and promote an engaged and empowered business community to take care of itself in the ways it sees most fit to serve themselves. Shall the CBID ballot pass on June 25th? Details will be put in motion to begin service implementation in early 2025. The CBID will finally allow us to create a very high quality, safe, beautiful, thriving space that our entire community can be proud of. The CBID will help create the environment to support existing businesses and attract new businesses. Once the CBID ballots are counted and this goes into effect, many of the downtown organization services will transition to this new service mechanism via a new and improved nonprofit corporation managed by property and business owners. Shall the CBID be approved, the existing business improvement district would not be renewed. Public meetings would be held regularly where all can participate and per the Brown Act noticed in advance with agendas, minutes, and financials posted. I thank the city council members and city staff for our ongoing partnership with the downtown organization. This initiative represents the next phase of that strong public-private partnership. Thank, thank you. you. Jeffrey Carter, followed by Ron Robertson. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and council members. My name is Jeffrey Carter, and I am a commercial property manager in the downtown area. Uh, I work with property owners on a daily basis, and I see a recurring uh, list of concerns about the downtown area that range from an inability sometimes to attract high quality tenants to vacancies um, based on uncertainty about the future of downtown, um, as well as um, a concern from individuals, visitors, and uh, residents alike about um, safety and cleanliness in the downtown. Um, there is a lot of hope with the CBIT initiative that um, these things can be addressed by unifying a previously underrepresented group of people who have already invested tremendously in our downtown by purchasing real estate here. Um, their support for this and future participation in this effort will be a major vote of confidence in our future in State Street, downtown, and our um, you know, collective community here in Santa Barbara. Um, so that, and it will provide them an opportunity to voice and address their needs that we've never seen before. So it's my opinion that this will lead to a greater economic vitality on State Street, as well as lower commercial vacancy rates by allowing the needs of property owners to be heard. And by increasing the appeal of our downtown and showing potential businesses and customers that this community does care enough to come together and find solutions to problems that may seem impossible to overcome on an individual basis. Uh, one thing we should not be uncertain, to, uncertain of is the resiliency of our business community, including property owners, and their ability to make lasting changes through their power of organization, advocacy, and diligence. So with your, your vote um, and blessing, I hope that we are able to do this together. Thank you. Thank you. Ron Robertson, followed by Kristen Miller. Mr. Mayor, City Council, and congratulations to Ms. Harmons on having your third. I've got three, and she just complicated her life. <laughs> um, so I, this is what I was going to say. I was going to cover some points, but I'd rather actually answer your, uh, your questions, Mr. Mayor. So sitting through the short-term rental thing, and they've got uh, 
police officer, ex -poli uh, retired police officers, et cetera, uh, doing their investigations. There are 430 some odd um, properties on, on State Street in this zone. It's hard to get through the veil of the LLCs and it's hard to get the contacts. Uh, we, I mean, I think a, a, a big, uh, you know, thank you goes to Pralium who actually signed on. We got them. Uh, we talked to AB in Georgetown who you guys are dealing with. Their excuse was that um, they were um, in negotiations with you and they didn't want to sign. They were for it. Uh, the AB uh, CEO actually helped start one in New York and he thinks they're great. Um, so I just wanted to answer that question. It's hard. Uh, we worked a long time. Um, Robin interviewed me on uh, one of her shows and we got three people to sign up that had never heard of the CBID. Um, so we finally got the media involved. Uh, another uh, point was is that they said, well, if the city council hasn't voted on this and if they're not behind it, we're not behind it. Uh, and then the second and, or the third and final point in a minute and 19 seconds is uh, the, I own the Bal my mother, brother, and I own the Balboa building at 735 State Street. Um, our current bid is $2,000. Uh, that's this year. Last year was $1,700. We're, I'm going to go to $23,000. That's a self-tax. That's not a small nut. And we were reassessed for our property taxes, I won't explain why, of another 20000 Why would I do that as a business person, a property owner? Because I believe in this with every cell in my body. Because we've had people, in, uh, our businesses in State Street who've moved to Montecito. They didn't go bankrupt, they didn't uh, leave for, um, for that reason. They moved to Montecito. I'd like, to, sorry Trey, I'd like to see him come back. I'd like to create, sorry, I, I'd like to create a, an environment where they would, would, where they would want to come back. Right now there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle. State Street Advisory Committee, uh, hopefully they'll come up with something great. Um, we've got We've got a ton of things. I think this CBID is one of those pieces of puzzle. And if we don't have it, okay, I'll shut up. Um, if we don't have it, then I'm not sure that the puzzle, that the picture is going to be complete. So please vote yes. Thank you. Christian Miller followed by Trevor Large. As you can see, we have a great committee with some great speakers and they have said uh, so much. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Rouse and members of the council. I'm Kristen Miller, President and CEO of the Santa Barbara South Coast Chamber of Commerce, representing 800 members and 70,000 jobs on the South Coast. The chamber supports the formation of the CBID, an essential mechanism for downtown property owners uh, to enable focused investments and improvements in Santa Barbara downtown. The chamber works to improve business conditions in all of the downtowns on the South Coast. The State Street Corridor and downtown Santa Barbara is in the most need and has the most impact on our local economy. Therefore, we have invested significant resources and volunteer time to promote the formation of the seabed. The CBID creates funding for a new district to directly address current issues affecting property owners, businesses, and the community. Businesses will benefit by having their property owner advocate for them as a unified voice addressing the specific needs of downtown with the purpose of attracting new customers, new businesses, welcoming residents, and appealing to visitors. This is a modern and well-proven method of creating solutions for downtown improvement and community benefits used all across the state. When the city signs the petition, hopefully, for the CBID, it does signal to the business community that we're working together in a public-private partnership to support business in our downtown district. Your support enabling this initiative to advance to an official ballot ensures that all voices will be heard, all stakeholders can have a say in the future of our downtown. Thank you for recognizing the importance of this initiative and for supporting the next step of the CBID formation process. Thank you. Thank you. Trevor Large. Mr. Mayor, City Council members, uh, thank you very much for allowing us to speak here today on this important topic. 
Um, I'm uh, on the CBIG committee. I'm also a downtown business owner. I'm just across the street in the El Paseo building. I spend a lot of my time and my employees spend a lot of their time in the downtown area. Um, I think this is a really exciting day. Um, I, a lot of people have worked really hard to get us to this point. Um, I'm, I'm happy to have been part of this committee, I've worked with some really great people. Uh, they understand the issues surrounding downtown, and today I think, I'm hoping, that collectively we're going to get to take the first concrete steps towards a real action that will move us forward on State Street. Um, for too long, there's been a lot of finger pointing, both at property owners, uh, at the city uh, or the city council, saying, who's to blame for this? Who's going to do something about this? Well, today, both these groups get together and join, hopefully, about uh, and solve this problem. Say, we're going to do something about this together. Um, we are both willing, both the property owners and hopefully the city council, to commit our own funds to make State Street and the downtown a better, safer, and more desirable destination. As you've heard throughout California, CBIDs have been proven as a successful model uh, for property owners to assess themselves and pool uh, that money to create a greater effect. Mr. Pinner did a great job explaining how that's been successful uh, on Coast Village Road. And what this can mean for State Street and downtown is uh, new reasons for businesses, investors, locals, and visitors to come to State Street, to come to downtown and spend their time there. Um, I want to address the, the comment from the mayor about uh, the 30% threshold. Uh, there's been some comments around town about how it's important that we hit that 30% threshold separately and the, the city should be one side and the property owners are the other. I just, I disagree with that uh, vehemently. Um, this is a public private partnership in our minds. So the city being the one to get us over that threshold is perfect. It's, it shows that we are working together, property owners and the city, to really say, hey, we are going to put our own skin in the game, all of us, and try to fix and solve this problem um, that we have downtown. I think the downtown organization and the chamber working together um, shows that these groups really believe in this process and that the city should as well. Uh, you know, if these, were, if these blinds were open, you know, it's sunny and 75 outside and you're on State Street and you look down to the ocean and this is a day when the splendor of Santa Barbara is on display and we want the downtown to look and be great. That's what this is all about. So based on everything that you're seeing and that you know that this city can be on a day like today, I wanna thank you um, for allowing us to speak and please, please vote in favor of signing the CBA petition. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have commenters online? Yes, Mr. Mayor, we have one raised hand, Jim Cannell. Jim Cannell, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jim Cannell. I'm the second largest property holder in the city of Santa Barbara, and I am opposed to the CBIT on a lot of levels, but primarily because it basically, it basically takes the ownership of my properties and puts it in the hands of a collective. Well, if you look at our properties, we have some of the nicest, well-occupied properties in the city of Santa Barbara. There's a reason. We bid our expenses, we maintain our properties, and we promote our properties. The C bid actually increases our costs by 20% over what the C bid is proposed. It inaccurately measures our property square footage, so it basically penalizes us. The C bid works well for a collective of small property owners, not a group of large property owners. You can't compare State Street and Coast Village as the same beast. They're different. One street is open, one street is closed. One street is faced with different issues than the other. This is a collective that is destined to fail. And we are at a point now where nobody's talking about how the tenants' rents are going to increase 
from the standpoint of those that are on triple net leases are going to be billed extra costs. Nobody's talking about whether or not the structure with respect to the administration of this will, will really work. Does the downtown organization continue to exist? Does the Chamber of Commerce continue to exist? These are all costs that we have in the city of Santa Barbara. And now you're going to layer them against the costs of additional CBIT costs that are in excess of what we currently pay. To say that you have a majority or you're getting to a majority when you have less than 70% of the or greater or greater than 70 percent of the property owners not voting for it and now you're going to push and take 30 percent and try to make it a majority by having the city of santa barbara vote for this the city of santa barbara are caretakers you you have the you have you're you're the caretakers for all of us to go to where you're going to be 70 percent they don't have the votes versus the 20 or 25 percent or whatever the heck that number is and you're going to go vote that direction is wrong you're taking my property rights away and i'm not supportive nor will i be supportive thank you thank you are there further speakers online madam clerk no mr mayor okay very good with that we'll come back to council uh alejandro gutierrez please Mr. Gutierrez. Thank Mr. You. Mayor, if I can just real quickly, um, to help guide with your process, process wise today, there's two recommendations for you. They should kind of be done separately. The first is to actually give the city administrator the authority to sign the petition. And once you vote on that and that's approved, then we can go into the second recommendation, which be the resolution of the council to declare its intention to establish the, the resolution of intent. So. I'm definitely in supportive of this um, CBID. I think it's really important. I've said it over and over about this city is about building relationships. Um, as the council, we don't have the answers for everything. We are not property owners in the downtown. It's very different to own property upper state or in, in other areas than the downtown. You guys are the experts, um, but we also have skin in the game. And I think COVID and what's going on downtown, we've spent a lot of energy pointing fingers, a, a lot of energy with frustration, pouring money, city staff. It is time that we come together. And it, this is sort of what I think the group has negotiated and, and not everybody is happy and I understand. And I totally understand the frustration of some of the property owners, uh, the city, has tried their very, very best, but I, I am gonna acknowledge that there's community members that have lost trust, and I, I will acknowledge it. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend we've done everything right, but I think the city has now realized like we have to come together. And State Street is, it's the heart of the city, even though I wanna say that Milpa's is, because <laughs> of my bias, but I think, um, Coast Village Road really set the tone that when you come together in a time of crisis, what, what actually can flourish out of it. And in Santa Barbara, if we don't start working together, we will end up where we're at now and we will create more and more division to the point where people are not gonna wanna work together. Um, so I will be very supportive uh, uh, for the re staff recommendation. Ms. Snudden. Thank you, Mayor Rouse. Well, I'm all in and with gratitude for the steering committee and what you have done to rally support and to really educate property owners and business owners of what the benefits of this would be and also to educate council on the benefits. Really grateful to Brandon Bodette, Downtown Santa Barbara, uh, Santa Barbara South Coast Chamber and the steering committee for the outreach events and the multiple avenues and ways that you have attempted to reach property owners, to educate, to really um, be in conversation. 
and to Mr. Pinner's enhanced services engagement voice, I would also add agency to make decisions with a collective voice. Um, as district representative for Coast Village Road, I can say from experience, it is so incredibly helpful to have the Coast Village CBID offering input and guidance and direction from the business owners themselves, the property owners themselves on what they need, which as the property owners, you know what you need. And I think with um, many years of frustration trying to communicate that to council and to try and rely on council to, to follow that direction or to fund initiatives that we may not have the funding for. Um, for all of those who wish that the city did more and have been frustrated, this gives the budget, the agency, the mechanism, the avenue to be able to actually achieve those improvements. This gives the property owners more of a voice on what improvements are prioritized and not relying just on city council with all of the priorities that we have to balance in our budgets and for the whole city. This gives more of a budget towards the downtown priorities. I'd be really proud to contribute to this venture. We've said it so many times, all of us wanting a safe, clean, welcoming, vibrant downtown. It's what we all want and have not had um, all of the funding to be able to concentrate in one zone. Um, for the business and community and property owners who know what they need, we should want to contribute in partnership and really with gratitude um, that this is a shared venture and um, we can count on the, the direction from this collective voice. I'd be happy to move recommendation A. Okay, Mr. Friedman. Uh, thank you. So uh, first, thanks to all that, uh, all the work that went into this from our community partners, both businesses and property owners, and those who spoke tonight. Um, a lot of outstanding community leaders here who uh, don't usually come to council. So when they do come here, it's important that we really take it seriously, um, that they took time out of your schedules to come here and, and sit through the, the hearing and, and speak in favor of this. I want to thank Mr. Pinner and your experience uh, with the Coast Village Road and Mr. Baudet. Uh, for leading it from our side. Uh, I'm supportive of uh, moving both of these forward. My colleagues uh, have articulated um, the reasons for it. Uh, so just two things to add. One is the council today, we're allowing it to go forward to a vote of the property owners. And I think that's forgot. We're not passing it today. It has to go to a vote and the property owners will decide. If we said no, even though you have all these property owners, they just want a shot to do it and they want a shot to make the case. We would be prematurely in actually making a decision to say, no, you don't have that, that choice to do that. By moving both of these forward, that choice is available. They can make the best case. And I think there's a strong case to be made today. We've heard it. And then maybe it, you'll get that other 15% because right now it's only at 36. So if you stay exactly where you are, and uh, it won't pass. But I think uh, there's a lot of time to go out there and do it. And then the other aspect is that uh, in terms of the issue, and I understand it, uh, that it was raised about this being passed on to some of the businesses uh, through triple net leases. Uh, the alternative is that if you don't do this, not much is going to change on State Street. There's, there's a long convoluted muddy process that we're still going through. Uh, but what this would do is it would help us get cleanliness, some of the things that have been added that would attract people back downtown, the first step. And that means more people more downtown, more people going into your businesses, and that's what you need down there. And this is the first step while we're continuing to develop our plan. So um, with those two in mind, uh, I'm ready to move it forward and see if uh, the, the group can come together and get that other 15%. So I'll be supportive. I'll second uh, the motion for A. So before I will, we'll, I'll come back for clarity on the motions when we get done with comments here. Mr. Jordan. The alternative is um, status quo on top of too many years of status quo. And if anybody thinks that uh, that's 
not real a realistic assessment uh, from somebody whose cup is usually uh, half empty. It's we I've got enough baggage in trying this twice in my life now to know that we're right back at where we were in status quo the first time we we tried this. Um, I wholeheartedly will support this. I, I think uh, Trevor Large said it a little bit. I'll paraphrase, but. Um, I want to be holding hands with the stakeholders and walk this past the 30% level um, rather than find a way at a half a percent or 1% or whatever to put a stop on it and, and bear the burden of being the city stopped this and didn't let it go to the voting stakeholders. That's where it should go. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a failure of the hundreds of uh, uh, CBIDs or PBIDs in the state of California. I know there's been a couple, but a couple out of hundreds, they, uh, they typically um, uh, unite the business stakeholders that weren't previously united. We are probably a little bit unique when you look at the uh, mailing addresses for property taxes, and many of them are out of state for our downtown. Uh, probably a little different than that walkabout of 70-some uh, people on Coast Village Road. Um, so the problem is a little more difficult. But the end result deserves to have its, have its day at the voting box and let the participants uh, cast their ballot. It gives them an opportunity to have $2 million of self-determination above and beyond the current status quo just continuing. Um, Ron, I think, Ron Robertson, I think you talked about uh, this is just one of the many pieces of the city, and all you said was the tiny little problem of State Street. Well, I'm going to list out what I think equates into what Trevor called an exciting time. The freeway, under, the freeway underpass is, is in construction right now. State Street is continuing to be work done right now. De La Guerra Plaza, the Paseo Nuevo Apartments, Library Plaza, the News Press property, the News Police Station, Peter Lewis's apartments at the, at the base of State Street, a new hotel a block down in the 700 block, and one I just saw, that this is uh, just last week, was the Frontier Building Apartments, a block over on Chapala and De La Guerra. If this, if this doesn't represent an exciting time for Santa Barbara on what the future could look like to move forward and be supportive, I don't, I don't know what it would take. I mean, go back 100, 100 years and be another earthquake that knocks the whole city down because that's this type that's this type of time it is for us to start looking forward into the future of Santa Barbara. So um, I too will uh, be happy to support the uh, staff recommendation. Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I want to thank everyone who um, spearheaded this and, and really fought for this because I know I myself and my colleagues have spent a lot of time listening to all of your thoughts and ideas, opinions and concerns about the current state of the economy in our city. And um, I can just, all I want to say is to the people that aren't for this, that, um, that I've met with some of you as well, uh, personally went out to meet with you because a lot of you said that you're not willing to come to the table. And it, um, it hurts me to hear them say that, those business owners, uh, those property owners, because um, the mindset of, I don't want to be a part of a club that would have me as a member, isn't going to help you and the overall community. So if you want to be taken seriously, if you want your thoughts and ideas and concerns to be heard and validated, come to the table, play ball, be a team member, um, and again, I, I just compliment and appreciate all of you for rolling up your sleeves and making this happen, because we've been asking for years for all of you to come to, to tell us how to help you, and here you are, so much appreciated. All right, very good. Um, so I'm personally in favor of things like biz and CBiz. I was very enthusiastically supportive of the Coast Village Road one. We tried to get one started on Milpas. Maybe we'll get another shot at that one day. Um, there are a few things I think we need to be mindful of as we go forward. There were some big hitters in today with 
Ron Robertson and Peter Lewis, and the other big hitter was Jim Cannell, and they have different views of the way we look at this thing. And as we talk about and complain about rents on State Street and business expenses, well, not, this does increase that. And, and I, but I, I like the idea that there's a groundswell of people willing to self-assess. I feel a little jaded actually being in a city position because we don't own anything. We steward, we're stewards of your property. And when we pay our assessments, you're paying for it because it's tax money we're paying it with. So we have to really understand that. So when we talk about skin in the game, well, we already have more skin in the game than we will then. We're, we probably spend more money on the DSB than we will in our new assessment f profile. So it's, it's gonna be great for us to do that. But what bothers me about being in this position today or something that you guys are all very painful aware of, I, you know, the fact that there are some self-inflicted wounds, the continued closure of State Street, the now deficit we face seriously in our parking systems for whatever reason, the fact that we voted away two thirds of the proposed by staff budget to clean State Street. So now we're going back and you guys are willing to self-assess and I think that's great. And I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and stand in the way of that. I mean, you know, I don't think you stand in the way of it anyway because these, these guys are all gonna vote for it. But I think there's concerns about the composition of the board and, and Mr. Pinner, I'm still working through the Pinner algorithm by the way. That's a mathematical thing that I'm sure I'm gonna have to sit down with you someday or a few. Uh, but going back and saying, um, what's the composition of the board going to be, what the desires are. There's always a lot of talk about security, and that always kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies, only because you've got to understand what your limits are in the public right away with security. And if you're going to talk like you do in the CAR about maybe hiring, you know, off-duty or, or overtime police, better sit down with Chief first to make sure that's exactly what you guys all have in mind. I mean, that's just, that's just vital. But... Um, but going forward, I, like I said, the, I understand through the threads of ownerships how hard it can be to find the LLC owners and all the people that you know, go back for the properties. I get all that. And we've heard, some, like I say, from some major players today about their enthusiasm for going forward. I feel this, I just feel like as a body that, you know, frankly, we haven't done everything we can do. And I, I'm a little, frankly, a little chagrined about that. Uh, but you guys are willing to go forward and take the leadership role. But once again, I don't feel like we should be the ones that actually drag you across the line and bring you into the light in terms of the numerical part. Yeah, we're going to be an 8% stakeholder. The county on top of that is going to be probably another 3%, and that's just fine. And then you guys still have to get out there and get the rest of that percentage to vote for the final assessment. So this isn't the end game, obviously. So I'm completely willing to support my colleagues and go forward with today's. But I just hope we're mindful of the rest of this stuff. I mean, I know we're enthusiastic, been a ton of effort. You guys have spent a ton of time and a ton of meetings, but there's some realities to involve with that as well. And the realities are gonna be in the checks of the tenants writing their rent checks. Uh, it's gonna be in the property owner's assessments and how they, they handle this. And so hopefully we're accurate and hopefully it is. I, I don't think it's not a come to the table thing I think it's a reality thing. If we're gonna complain about rents on State Street and then we're going to assess more rent, it just is a mixed message. So, you know, once again, a bid is a great idea. It's a, it's a, it's a self-assessment. I don't consider us part of the self. We'll participate with our assessment payments, but we didn't take any risk. We didn't buy any property. We never did, you guys did. And so I don't consider us equal, frankly. But as far as getting forward to the next level, you know, if we're going to do it. It looks we're going to do it here anyway. So let's go ahead and do it, and hopefully, it'll be successful. And hopefully, the board that finally gets appointed or chosen will have everyone in mind, not just the people who were kumbaya about this assessment, but the people who resisted it the most as well. That's equally as important, if not more. So, with that, uh, Ms. Snidden, would you clarify your motion, please? Um, yes, Mayor Rouse, but first I have an acronym, and it's SAVE Downtown Services Agency Voice and Engagement. Um, I would like to um, move recommendation A, and that is to direct the city administrator to sign the petitions of city-owned properties within the proposed Downtown Community Benefit Improvement District. Okay, and Mr. Freeman? 
<laughs> I'll second it, but I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come up with a slogan for your acronym. <laughs> <laughs> Status quo, vote no. Clean up the mess, vote yes. Okay, very good. We have a motion and a second. Does everyone understand the motion? It's for, uh, for, it's for item A, 11A. Very good. That's a motion by Councilmember Snedden, seconded by Councilmember Friedman for recommendation A. Maybe please, vote, please, go ahead. So. Pass unanimously. Megan Harmon absent. Okay. Uh, we need a further amendment. Ms. Sen, do you want to go again? I'm sure. I'd go ahead and move recommendation B. A second. Okay. And seconded by Alejandro Gutierrez. All right, we all set? Everybody understand the motion? May we have the vote, please? And if I might confirm, um, this is a motion only for recommendation B, not B and C? I'd be happy to move B and C, but the recommended order. Can we order... take those together? Mr. Mayor, Council Members, you can do B and C. Obviously. Let's do B and C. Okay. Thank you. So amend, amend, good. All right. Everybody understand the motion? Away we go. So this is a motion by Council Member Snedden, seconded by Council Member Friedman? No, seconded by Council Member Alejandro Gutierrez for recommendations B and C. Give you one job. Thank you. Pass unanimously. Megan Harmon absent. All right. Thank you all very much. Um, do you say you want to take a break? Yeah. We can. Uh, the pleasure of the council. Do you want to break, take a break or your soldier on? We, we know where you're going. Yeah, okay. okay um, Madam Clerk, would you read item 12, please? Yes. Item 12, Castillo Street Undercrossing Bicycle and Pedestrian Facility Improvements Project Resolution. Recommendation the council adopt by reading of title only a resolution of the council of the city of Santa Barbara supporting the Castillo Street undercrossing bicycle and pedestrian facility improvements project and directing staff to apply for a grant to fund design, environmental review, and construction. There we go. Ms. Grant. Or who's, who's going to be the yes. presenter? Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Rouse and council members. I'm Jessica Grant, Supervising Transportation Planner, and we're here to discuss the Castillo Undercrossing Bicycle and Pedestrian uh, Facility Improvements Project. And here to kick us off is Chelsea Swanson, um, part of our transportation planning team to give the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Swanson. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Go to the next slide. So we're here today to um, request that City Council support the Castillo Street Undercrossing Bicycle and Pedestrian Improvements Project and provide direction to staff to apply for a grant to fund design, environmental review, and construction. So just to orient everyone of the project location that we're looking at today, it is the Castillo Street Undercrossing at Castillo and Highway 101 and also the approaches to the undercrossing under along Castillo Street and the Haley Street corridor. Uh, this is a critical connection between the downtown and the waterfront, and it's also a very important connection for Santa Barbara City College. We've learned over many years uh, and heard from the community through both this planning effort and previous planning efforts that there's a, a big need out there to improve walking and biking facilities uh, within this critical connection. 
We also know Castillo Street is a Vision Zero priority corridor. Um, that would mean that there is a pattern of collisions within this corridor um, where they're, uh, are, they're resulting in serious or fatal uh, injuries. Um, the image on the right is what we would call a heat map. Um, with Just to orient you, the, the big red blobs in the middle are uh, focused more on State Street. The project limits are here, Castillo and Haley. And um, this is just really to highlight that uh, the warmer the color, the more the collisions. And so we are seeing a pattern within Castillo Street for collisions. And um, this data comes from the Transportation Injury Mapping System, or TIMS, which is a, a statewide database. Um, and this represents pedestrian and bicycle crash data between 2014 and 2021. And in, in this slide, we're just going to zoom in again on that same um, area, the project area, Castillo Street here, Haley Street here, and again, just identifying where we're seeing patterns of bicycle and pedestrian crashes over this period of time. So knowing there's a, a request from the community for improvements within this corridor and that we do have, uh, it is a, a Vision Zero Priority Corridor, the city went after a Measure A grant and received funding for a planning effort in 2020. So this slide is just really um, a summary of some of the main points that we've had throughout this planning effort. Um, the planning effort funded survey work for right-of-way boundaries. Um, it allowed for several coordination meetings with Caltrans because the project does overlap with their right-of-way and facilities. Um, we, of course, had um, public outreach, which initiated in 2022, and we most recently had public outreach in 2024. Uh, we've also taken this to the Transportation and Circulation Committee, and we've also had meetings with private property owners. Um, there are two locations where we're looking at potential sidewalk widening that could result in potential uh, property acquisition. So again, the purpose of the planning effort is really to create safer walking and biking facilities within the Castillo Street undercrossing and the approaches to the undercrossing, which is a critical connection between downtown, coastal attractions, and city college. So just to talk about uh, the need a little bit further, this image um, is really to, to highlight the need for better bicycle connectivity. The area where you see the, the black arrows at the top of the screen, that is our downtown where we have um, really good connectivity with bicycle facilities. The red arrows really are the project uh, boundaries. This is Haley Street here. This is Castillo Street. Um, that's where we're seeing, we have a gap in our uh, connectivity. So if you want to get from the downtown again to the waterfront, um, there is a, a gap in adequate facilities here. Um, the image on the left is Castillo Street south of Highway 1, 101 and uh, south of the UPRR Bridge. Um, this is an area that we're really looking to address and where we've also heard from the community. If you're a cyclist, you can see where the bike lane, if you're coming uphill towards the intersection to Montecito Street, so you'd be headed toward the, towards the waterfront, uh, the bike lane simply ends and you must start sharing the, um, the travel lane with vehicles who want to turn right onto Montecito and continue up Cliff Drive. That's a really heavy vehicular movement um, between 400 and 600 vehicles per hour at the peak. Um, so it's a really challenging area to navigate as a cyclist. If you want to continue straight and head towards the waterfront, you're in conflict with that uh, vehicular traffic. On the right is an image of 300 West Block of Haley Street. And again, it's a cyclist headed towards the downtown. And again, this is just to highlight where we have a gap in the connectivity um, in the Haley Street corridor. And again, a, a well-traveled vehicular um, route and no separated facility for cyclists. If you've driven, walked, or biked in the undercrossing, we're all very aware that it's often wet, and that's due to a, a high water table, 
within the undercrossing, uh, which is a, a Caltrans facility and Caltrans right of way. And so we also hear a lot from the community about how this is a safety hazard for cycling in particular to ride through that wet bike lane. With regard to um, pedestrian facilities, uh, we've also heard there's a lack in adequate um, sidewalk. All of these images are taken on Castillo Street on the 300 block south of Highway 101. Um, and it really highlights, it's mostly narrow, five foot wide sidewalk, doesn't meet um, our recommended standards. There are no buffers or street trees between the pedestrian and the uh, vehicular traffic. Um, and then also like in the center, Bodhi, you can see there are sections that are also not ADA compliant. We've also heard um, in this corridor in particular that there's a lack of lighting for pedestrians. Um, the example of the image on the left, that's on Haley Street. Again, just another example where we have an opportunity to widen the sidewalk. Um, it's a five foot wide sidewalk adjacent to traffic. Um, in that specific location, we would need to remove uh, the palm trees you see on the right, those are located in public right of way. Um, if we were to widen here, we would have the opportunity though to add uh, new street trees in the parkway area. Um, and that was supported by the community during our outreach effort. And then the image on the right is really just to show an example of an ideal sidewalk corridor uh, with a six foot wide sidewalk and a four foot wide uh, parkway or tree well, tree well area. So back to the, un, the issue in the undercrossing real quick. We, when we did initial outreach in 2022, um, the intention wasn't to make any changes within the undercrossing um, with this project. Uh, it is a Caltrans facility. We know the long-term fix is very expensive um, and to reconstruct the entire freeway structure in this location. However, we did hear from um, residents during that outreach um, a request to look into widening the sidewalk within the undercrossing and create a shared facility with the idea of elevating cyclists out of that uh, wet bike lane and creating a wider path that could be shared by both uh, walkers and bikers. So that, that was a great suggestion that came out of um, our initial outreach. We have met with Caltrans to discuss this and they're in support of it. And um, we would anticipate uh, if we were to make this improvement, that Caltrans also would, um, at the same time, do some repair work on that topper slab at, um, as well. So I'm just gonna walk through um, the highlights of the conceptual plans that were developed um, over the last few years through this public outreach process. Just to orient everyone, um, Castillo Street is running horizontally and Montecito Street is running vertically. Um, the 7-Eleven would be up in this corner, gas station down here. Um, I also wanted to point out this is the beginning location or the ending location, if you will, of the Cliff Drive Vision Zero project, but we'll have a separated path here um, from Cliff Drive all the way to Hendry's Beach. So this project ties in um, nicely with that project that's currently in design and will be constructed in a few years. So if we look first at the um, west side of Castillo here, this green line, which really is just um, to represent where an elevated bike lane would go, it wouldn't all be green, but for purposes of demonstrating where it would be located. Um, if you think back to the slide where cyclists were riding uphill uh, and we have the heavy right turn movement of drivers. This would separate cyclists um, so they could be in their own elevated bike lane and take away that conflict. And then at the intersection, there'd be a dedicated uh, bike signal. So if bikes wanted to continue straight, there would not be that conflict with right turning vehicles at the same time. So it's a, it's a win-win for uh, both drivers and cyclists in this location to remove that um, potential conflict. On the same side of the street, we also have sidewalk widening opportunities. Um, this location um, here is owned by the Santa Barbara Historical Museum. It is a location where there is potential property acquisition to widen the sidewalk, and we've had conversations with the museum and we'll continue to coordinate with them uh, should the project move forward. On the other side of the street, um, 
there's not enough room to uh, have a dedicated separated bike lane on the stretch of Castillo just based on right of way constraints because cyclists are more comfortable headed downhill towards um, the undercrossing, there would be a shared facility there with, with Shero, so a class three in street facility. For sidewalk purposes, we'd also are looking to widen um, the sidewalk and add uh, tree wells here. And this is the other location, it's the genealogical society where there's a potential, uh, it would require acquisition, property acquisition, and we've had a couple meetings with them as well about this proposed project, which will be ongoing. So moving towards the highway, this just shows the entire block now, of the 300 uh, block of Castillo. And here you can see that the elevated bike lane would start um, close to where the UPRR bridge is and continue all the way up to the intersection. And again, sidewalk widening opportunities on both sides of the street. And also we would have enhanced lighting in this corridor. Now we are moving towards the downtown. The undercrossing is here under Highway 101. Again, this is the area where we are proposing to widen that sidewalk on both sides of the undercrossing um, up to eight feet. That's as much as we can go based on the existing constraints within the undercrossing. But we think it would be a, definitely an improvement um, to elevate cyclists, uh, again, out of that wet bike lane. If a cyclist were to head towards the downtown, take a ride onto Haley Street, they would continue in a separated elevated bike lane, and then it would continue into an on-street bike lane for a block. If the cyclists were headed or continuing on Castillo, there would also be a, a dedicated bike lane headed um, north. If the cyclists were headed towards the waterfront on Castillo, they would enter the elevated bike lane, and then again, the shared facility within the undercrossing. The other items in the slide, there's sidewalk widening opportunity. This is the location where there would be the palm tree removal, again, all within the right of way on Haley Street and also some opportunity near the DMV property on Castillo. So I apologize, but now we've, we've reoriented the plan so that Castillo Street is running up and down and Haley is running uh, from left to right. So again, this, this is just the connection where um, a cyclist would enter the bike lane on street onto Haley Street, and I'll get into in just a second um, how we would fit that new bike lane in. Okay, so in this image, we have Bath Street on the left, or the 200 West Block of Haley, with De La Vina on the right. Um, this section of Haley, um, we had two options to look at for implementing a bike lane. This is the preferred option that we heard from the community. It's a separated uh, path again that would be adjacent to the sidewalk. We would also have to recess the parking basically into the parkway area and alternate parking and, and tree wells, um, which you can see here. We would anticipate um, minimal parking loss here. We had it would depend on the design and how spaced out the trees are but between the parking, um, but we would estimate three to four spaces to be removed. The one good thing about the bike lane um, headed towards the downtown in this location as well is it fills in the gap to the entire Haley corridor, which stretches all the way to the east side. Uh, there's also no driveways on this block, which is a nice feature because it minimizes conflicts with cyclists. All of these properties have uh, parking access from the alley behind the, the properties. This image is just a, a section as if we were looking down Haley Street on that same block and uh, you would have the sidewalk here, five foot wide sidewalk, and you'd have cyclists within a four and a half foot wide bike lane right next to the sidewalk. Again, this represents a parked vehicle where you'd have tree wells alternating parking spaces. So 
So a couple slides ago, we talked about how we were gonna fit a new bike lane onto Haley Street, headed eastbound. Um, the image on the left shows the alignment of the proposed bike lane. So you'd, as you come out of the undercrossing and turn right from Castillo onto Haley Street. Um, in order to fit that in, we need to make some striping changes near the intersection of Haley and Bath Street. So the image on the left, again, we're at the Haley and Bath Street intersection. Um, we need to remove one vehicular westbound travel lane at this location. Um, and you can see the image on the right that allows for adding in a bike lane on just one side of the street. Again, we're still at the Haley and Bath intersection and just showing in the areas closest to the intersection where there's two uh, westbound travel lanes, it would go down to one, but it's just for a, a short stretch. Once you continue further on, to, um, on Haley towards Castillo Street, it goes back to two lanes and eventually three. So if we remove um, this vehicular travel lane, that does reduce capacity of the intersection. So in order to offset that reduction, we would need to change the 400 back block of Bath Street, which is between Highway 101 and Haley, down here. It's currently a two-way, and we would need to change it to a one-way, and we would add a new dedicated left turn lane from Bath Street onto Haley. And that would make up for the loss of capacity for taking away the westbound travel lane on Haley. So we studied this, um, Derek's team studied this, and it's actually a, a net improvement as far as traffic flow goes for this intersection. It makes the intersection run uh, more efficiently than it currently does. The change also does um, create a change to access for those residents and um, business on the 400 block of Bath Street. So again, the block that is where you exit Highway 101 and you enter Bath Street between um, the 101 and Haley Street, where there's approximately 10 properties. Um, so right now you can turn down Bath Street from Haley to access this block. With this change to a one-way, uh, you would need to take De La Vina and either come down the alley or take Cottage Grove Avenue over to Bath Street. Um, the access from Highway 101 would not change. You would still be able to access Bath Street as you do currently. Oh, I'm gonna go back to the slide real quick. So we did um, hear from residents on the 400 block at the most recent outreach that they did have concerns with changing circulation on this block. We also heard from uh, residents that they were concerned about the speed of drivers coming off Highway 101 onto their into the neighborhood and onto the, um, onto the 400 block of Bath Street. So we will be looking into um, some speed control measures at that location. We'll need to coordinate with emergency response, PD and fire, um, with anything we implement. But it's something we can look into either with the project or before the project. Just wanted to share a few photos from our most recent outreach we uh, held in March. This was on the Haley and De La Vina Bridge, and we had really great um, uh, turnout from the residents. Um, and thank you, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez for coming and joining us and getting helping to get the word out. We appreciate your time that day. Um, so we just we had a lot of great feedback and participation, um, both at the webinar and the in-person meeting. Project funding, um, the current cost estimate for this project for design, environmental review, construction for the total project is currently in the range of 10 to 12 million. Um, as you all know, uh, we have the active transportation program cycle seven, which is currently open and applications are due in June. Um, we do think this is a very likely funding source for this project. And so we intend to submit an application for that funding source. Um, as you also know, in recent discussions with the Lower East Side Plan, um, we're not in a position to offer local matching funds, but there is an opportunity to apply for a Measure A grant this fall, um, which we also think 
uh, we could be competitive for for what we think is going to be in the range of five hundred thousand dollars. So that could help with our um, application and uh, scoring. So the next steps would be if we get council support today, um, again, it would be to apply for that ATP grant in June. And ex if successful, we would anticipate construction around 2029. Um, however, we would anticipate a lot of further uh, opportunity for community engagement and review. This is just a list of some of the uh, ongoing review we would, we would need if we receive funding for this project. Com continued community engagement, Caltrans coordination, continued coordination with property owners where there could be potential property acquisition, um, design review by the HLC, um, the Street Tree Advisory and Parks and Rec Commission would look at tree removals and new trees. Um, we would need to go to the Ordinance Committee for changing the 400 block of Bath Street to a one-way, which would also return to council. And then, of course, environmental review and coastal review if we include um, portions of the project south of Montecito Street that are within the coastal zone. So with that, I'm going to put the recommendation back up on the screen, and uh, we welcome your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Back to Councilor Questions. Uh, Ms. Snudden. Thank you, Mayor Rouse. Um, first, for the underpass part, I think I'm so supportive. Um, I do have a question, but um, it, it, not even as a bicycle rider, but as a driver there. I come from City College to City Hall regularly, and it's, it's or off the freeway to go to City College, and it's terrifying to drive there when bikes are going through the wet, slick underpass there because they might lose control. Um, my question is about slide Maybe it's about slide 22. I'm not sure which slide, but can can you step me through because I, I can picture it so well. If if I'm a person is coming from City College and coming to City Hall, or from City College, a particularly very hard route is to get from City College to the library, say Anna Pamu. What what would be the the route does it does it change with the one-way streets or are those only on the blocks to the beach side of Haley can you, can you step me through that just I'm trying to put these different slides together so from the Mesa to City Hall how do you navigate that uh, mayor and uh, council members then are you in our just to clarify, driving, walking, biking? Driving. Driving yeah. from the Mesa to downtown. Yes. So the one way, the proposed one way on Bath Street, it wouldn't impact, if, if that's what you're asking, okay. it would not impact that route. It's okay. really the block, only the block between Highway 101 if you get off the Bath Street exit. Mm -hmm. That first block as you approach Haley Street, um, that's currently two way and that block would go just to one way. So if you're getting off Highway 101, you're, you're only going straight up Bath Street and you're either turning left on Haley or you're continuing straight on Bath. It really mostly impacts the immediate residents. Um, when we looked at that was gonna be traffic accounts and the, in the peaks, it was more than 400 um, trips in the peak hour going north. So people coming off Highway 101 going up Bath mm -hmm. for those headed the other way, it was less than 20, um, you know, it was yeah. in the teens. Okay. So it's really the very local um, residents that, that would likely have a change to their daily route. Thank you, and I can picture that now. That was really okay. helpful. So then for those residents, or the one where that current right arrow is pointing down on Bath Street, how do they get to their homes? Oh, on the slide you were just on. That was slide 22. Oh, yeah. this is the alternate. Thank you. Right. So again, um, right now, if you're coming either direction on Haley, you can turn down Bath Street um, because it's a two-way. Above, above Haley Street, it's one-way. Just, you know, Bath is one-way. So it's just this block. 
So instead of, if you're coming from Haley Street, you would take De La Vina, and you would either access through this alley, which is where all the, the parking is for these properties, or you could use Cottage Grove Ave um, to Bath Street. If you're coming from Highway 101 and you're exiting off Bath to go to your residence, nothing changes. You, you have direct access just as you do now. Um, so Cottage Grove is below any residence that would be on the west side of Bath Street there? Okay, thank you. Correct. Thank you. Councilmember Alejandro Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I have a quick question. So on the intersection of Bath and Haley, when is there any way that we could pull up Google Maps? Just, uh, so if somebody's going towards the 101 from Haley, like they're coming from State Street, taking Haley, is that Haley? Yeah, that makes sense. Towards the 101, there's two lanes, that's gonna become one, yeah? So on the opposite side, that's where we're gonna add the bike lane? Okay. And oh, oh, my- Oh, oh go ahead. You, yeah. My question is, just because in those peak hours, that, that section there gets, a, gets really crazy, uh, could city staff give me feedback on, I'm, look, I'm looking at Mr. Bailey, like, what, is, what are some of the outcomes of your research, just um, looking at the traffic flow, and if you can give me some examples of how that flow is gonna be better. Through the mayor, uh, council member Alejandro Gutierrez, um, as Ms. Swanson mentioned, the traffic volume going northbound on Bath Street during the peaks is like 400 an hour versus going the other directions like less than 20. If we can flush that 400 vehicles an hour out faster, it results in more green time for Haley Street. So right now the green time, you know, it's roughly 50-50, 50 for 50% 50 for Haley Street, 50% for Bath. But if we can flush that traffic out on Bath Street better, we can give a lot more green time to Haley Street. And that's how we can play with the lane configuration on Haley Street. Thank you so much. And actually, it, it ends up in a, in a net benefit yeah. for the intersection. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Thank you. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Stay right there, Derek, because uh, some of my questions are on this slide. So when I go through there is your absolute night, nightmare time. So going back to the Mesa, that would be, you know, 5.30 tonight type of thing. So the contention is, is that if you change Bath North, the 400 block northbound, you take up that row of cars there right now that lines up all the way to the freeway. You accommodate that. But is my perception wrong that more people at that intersection that come off the freeway want to turn left than go straight or turn right? Mayor Rouse, Council Member Jordan, it depends on the time of day. I must have the wrong time. And what's yeah. going on at City College okay. is a big driver. Because yeah. um, when, when I see it's a problem, there are cars backed up from whatever the, is that Castillo, where the freeway is, mm -hmm. all the way to this intersection already, and you're gonna chop that down to one lane, right? On that side of the street, next to the athletic club? Not quite, if you could back up a slide right there. Um, so if, if you look at either one of these, maybe the one on the left is a little bit easier to see. Um, where that red arrow is, just for the first 75 feet is where we have to remove a westbound lane. Once okay. you get beyond, um, okay. adjacent to the left turn pocket for yep. Haley's. All right. That's so we, where it opens we, back up. But we lose that queuing area for cars that I see when they're all the way backed up in two lanes, all the way to an intersection. And then we're trying to funnel more cars at this miserable time of the night, the evening, off left into that reduced queue. And that works in your math, right? It does. Okay. Um, it doesn't make it worse. Okay. Put it that way. The right. the bottleneck is at the on ramp intersection. 
Um, what often happens as well is when Highway 101 northbound is really congested, uh, people get off on Bath Street and try and cut up through downtown. Um, getting that traffic destined for the Mesa and Haley Street out of the way will facilitate that movement better as well. Okay. And then back on that first slide we were looking at that actually shows the bike lane you would gain on the downhill side, is that 23? Um, on Haley? It wasn't 23. Um, so you can go downtown that direction on Haley and the method, the, the messaging would be to come back and go back the other way because there's not a bike lane going the other way on Haley is you'd go up a block and come over to Castillo and then down. That would be, that would be the, the target That's route. That's the return route. The, we added a bike lane on Coda Street for westbound a few okay. years ago. Uh, so you could cut all the way over to Castillo and then there's a bike lane southbound from Coda. Okay. And, and that eastbound, uh, two, I think 200 block of Haley. So that's the first full block that you pick up uh, mostly residential in there or group homes kind of thing. I never see a parking space there any time of day, ever. Weekends, weekdays, any time of day. Um, so we'd have to remove some cars to basically uh, bring that curb out and, and save the trees that are there just by making it a tree island and let the parking in between. But, but we'd be telling the residents or who's ever using those literally 24 hours a day, never a parking space that we're going to lose some vehicles there, right? Vehicle parking there. That's accurate. Be and nice if we lose some vehicles, yeah, but we'll lose vehicle parking. Yeah. We will lose yeah. some okay. vehicle parking. And as what Ms. Swanson mentioned, just fewer trees results in more parking, more trees results yep. in less parking. No, and those are, I, whatever kind of trees there are, they're substantial trees, yep. tree stock on that road. And then last question, um, remind me, what did we have to offer as a percentage for the Cliff Drive project? 20. Yeah, so how uh, optimistic is it to say we'll go chase this uh, 5% level and it will actually be successful and not just languish there for multiple times through because we don't have the money to add to it. What's your guess tonight? We've been speculating. <laughs> it's probably less than 50% okay. chance of success. All right. So. But it, and to follow up on that comment, it's uh, just like the lower east side connectivity planning effort for the two projects coming out of that. It's it's still advantageous to go through the process to see how we score to see where the deficiencies are because uh, again the active transportation grant is um, very specific rubrics uh, some points we could easily gain by changing maybe one yep. sentence on a response and then other things might be out, yeah, out of our control. Yes, no, you the, just had, had yep. to play the game. The goal is to get um, yeah. perfect scores right. on every section except for the sections we can't control. So and then this one. I actually just hope you're in a weak field that year too, right? I mean, because right. yeah. you never know. Yes, until you never you, know. You never know until you're in. Correct. Okay. And Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. The next Brown. ATP cycle, the state could be flush with cash again, and there could be a really large um, available pool of money and trying to position ourselves well. So, um, Mr. Bailey, I've got kind of the follow-up questions with these guys. So when you do your, your traffic counts in those areas, have this must be at the same time Mr. Jordan's there. Uh, in terms of that intersection. The intersection where you, um, Haley dives into Castillo, what's the level of service at that intersection? In other words, what, because it, it seems like it can queue for a while, and if you're going in, I, I try to avoid peak city college times because that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a big deal there. But uh, I was also concerned about the removable lane westbound and whatnot, because it just seems like that can be, it seems like it does stack up, but I mean, you must, do your surveys at different parts of the day, right? We do, and except for the PM peak, um, drivers shouldn't notice much difference. What drivers will notice a difference in the PM peak is just, as Mr. Jordan mentioned, the, the stacking. 
the actual capacity of the intersection at Castillo doesn't change. There's the same lane configuration. It's just that for that 75 feet, there's probably three less vehicles that could stack up in that area. So that's what drivers would notice. All righty. And then um, I'm also concerned in that uh, the Bath Street off ramp with, um, I know there's a dry cleaners there on the corner. Are there more than one businesses in there? I thought there's a few businesses in there, are there not? Down in the cul-de-sac yeah. at the bottom, there there are. So that, I mean, and I hopefully they're part of the outreach efforts and whatnot that we're making in that area. So, because mm -hmm. I can just see, because I know there's trucks coming in out of there and the proximity to the off-ramp is also noteworthy. Not a piece of property I would buy, mm -hmm. but I mean, it's it's right there. So I would, you know, re, not being able to get to that going the other direction, I would think it'd be a, be a concern for those guys. But you're talking to them, okay. And then lastly, just a just a comment on that about this. The, the how many parking street is, uh, spaces are coming off of Haley? Again, it depends on the tree spacing, okay. but it's likely three to four with the configuration we've shown. But again, that yeah, we'll see. I, I just, that can be yeah, altered. I think those are pretty uh, parking is pretty dear down in that part of the, the city. So, all right, very good. Uh, with that, we will go to public comment. I have uh, Barry Remus. Uh, Castillo Haley by DMV. Good afternoon, Mayor Rouse and council members and members of the public. And my name is Barry Remis and I'm with Move Santa Barbara County and uh, we uh, represent well, close to over 10,000 supporters of active and sustainable transportation, uh, fans that inc uh, of, of transportation that includes walking and biking and transit and rail. And so as um, Ms. Swanson mentioned this uh, corridor being a Vision Zero corridor, and you might have seen on the slide all of those big yellow and red bursts of a activity reflecting collisions. It's clear that this is a, a corridor that needs attention. Uh, and also, as Councilmember Sneddon mentioned, the, uh, the wetness underneath the uh, underpass, uh, if, you're, if you're a pedestrian, you're dealing with very s narrow sidewalks. Uh, if you're a, a cyclist, um, you're often taking your life into your own hands. And if you make it out alive underneath the, the under, under crossing, then as you come out and you're heading south towards the beach, you then have to deal with the, uh, the, 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 the merge of traffic of trying to continue to stay straight. So this project, should you uh, approve the application for ATP funding and it should go ahead. Um, this would address a lot of that and that we, we support the widening of the pathway for the shared pathway of the eight foot uh, concrete area on both sides of the street for cyclists and pedestrians. And uh, we're also um, in, very much in support of the uh, Montecito Castillo uh, inter intersection with a dedicated green light for bike lanes uh, so that, excuse me, for bicyclists so that they continue, can continue safely uh, in that raised area to continue uh, towards the beach. And then, you know, for the, for the previous item for uh, improving access and, and um, vi revitalizing downtown, you obviously want to bring more people downtown. And this is a corridor that could al allow for the more of people to be able to get downtown walking and biking as well. Uh, so we want to be able to get, give them a safe passageway. And this would achieve that. We also support uh, the raised bikeway and the separated curb separated bikeway along Haley Street. We'd also like to support and see, if possible, um, ad additional uh, stop lines at each of the intersections so that stop lines are placed prior to crosswalks so that when uh, motorists stop their cars, they're not dead right onto the, almost onto the crosswalk as well. And also, uh, if cyclists specifically are coming from the DMV area headed southbound, but they want to make that left turn onto Haley Street, that's right at this moment uh, something that uh, isn't so much addressed, and we'd love to be able to see perhaps green conflict striping so that could guide them. If this, yes, as Chelsea is saying, if somebody's making a left turn on a, on a bike, they'd have to get into that left turn lane, and we'd like to be able to see a, a guidance uh, with perhaps a conflict striping that could guide them safely into onto Haley Street as well. So we hope that you'll approve the grant funding application. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Speaker online. We have one speaker online, Alex Gravener. Alex Gravener, please go ahead. 
Hi, Mayor, City Council. Um, my name is Alex Gravener. I'm a member of Strongtown Santa Barbara and uh, very happy to see this uh, bike lane project in progress. Um, generally, I want to voice my support, but I also have some comments about it. Um, generally, uh, going from the harbor kind of north uh, through that intersection, um, my impression is that it sounded like city staff said that there's not actually a bike lane there. It's just um, paint on the road. Um, I think they call it a class three bike lane. Um, that can be quite dangerous, I think, especially uh, with traffic turning right there onto the freeway. I think that a lot of cars are going to go very fast there to get onto the freeway and um, not pay attention to the bicyclists. So uh, I would suggest that maybe something more separate there would be better. Um, and I would say on the other side of the underpass as well, that's my main complaint, um, the sidewalk being wider is a nice uh, addition to try to make it uh, safer. However, uh, something like a vertical uh, barrier to stop someone slipping in the water and then falling over into the road, um, if they fall over and hit a, a barrier instead, um, uh, some kind of railing or something like that, that can be much safer. Um, so I would argue that something like that might be good. Um, and then just generally some comments about how we talk about these projects. Um, there's a lot of concern about losing three parking spaces, about some traffic coming off the highway being backed up a little bit more. Um, the goal of these projects should hopefully be to replace some of these cars with bikes. Um, those parking spaces are very close to downtown. A lot of downtown is reachable by biking from that area. So I would hope that with the new protected safe bike lane, a lot of those residents would be more happy to switch to biking. Um, so hopefully we can see infrastructure that accommodates more people and this can actually lead to higher throughput throughout our city. Um, but yeah, uh, besides uh, those comments, I really appreciate the city staff working on this project. I think that it's gonna be good going forward for the city. Thanks. Thank you. Any further speakers online, Madam Clerk? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay, back to council, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, great job um, kind of patchworking this all together. It's kind of mayhem when you look at it from above. Probably be mayhem when you look at it on the ground, but mayhem at above. Um, that uh, underpass, of course, has been a decades-long festering mess, and um, anything that uh, centers around it um, I'm 100% for, um, I, uh, specifically like the, that suggestion there of even though all you're doing is extending um, a sidewalk that's uh, 12 inches off the ground that the amount of cars and the way people drive going through um, uh, that underpass uh, and if you're going to put bikes in the in the mix too up on the sidewalk and somebody doesn't real, some, realize something and wants to go off the curb into the path of the car, I think it'd be real well, good money spent on both sides under the underpass to have a railing separating uh, those uh, extended sidewalks from, uh, from the traffic. From, not to protect cars from going in there, but to protect people from going out there, just so. Um, like that, um, you know, in the, uh, Barry mentioned the, uh, the, heat, the heat chart, you know, it's, it's, I, that's an issue, but it, as much of an issue too, it's also about everybody that won't ride down, down there just because it's like unsafe as heck. Um, you know, one day it's dry, the next day it's like you're not gonna make it and cars are switching lanes there when they realize they needed to be getting on the freeway or they needed to be going downtown and there's not a lot of room for, um, for, uh, for somebody to uh, resolve a mistake. Going home, that way you give them a bike lane if I turn left near the freeway entrance and then you immediately start taking it away at the worst time coming up the hill, you know, it like squishes into nothing and I'm just going like, oh my God. And then as soon as you get to the top of the hill, those that know you're already in a right-hand turn lane and the bicyclist is going, okay, what do I do now? Cars are going to turn, do I get over? Um, I think this just solves a whole bunch of messes there. Um, some of the other, I think you'll, I'm assuming you'll handle this kind of like cliff drive, you'll go chase the thing, we'll give some more money, we'll go chase the thing, we'll give some more money, 
we'll get the thing and then we will do some more outreach also to finalize the details because we can kind of address some of these issues on trees or cars as we actually have the project resources to go forward and make the final decision. So I think um, some of the things you heard about ablets down at the base and uh, the missing cars and how do the backups really work, that type of thing. Um, I think uh, I'd look forward to that. Then just as a user, I think also something we can control too in particular is going um, west on Haley um, to earlier and more visibly delineate the lanes that are going to be down there at the freeway on ramp. So I can't tell you how often one car in the left hand lane holds up both lanes halfway just because they're trying to half halfway get over they realize too late they need to be in the right hand lane to get on the freeway. I could probably also make the same you would know better maybe the same argument going the other way on the left turn there at the that would be going up some street at the parking lot for the athletic club that you really don't see the left turn arrow until you're literally on top of the intersection and seeing cars go two abreast straight ahead seen that see cars that stop and hold up all the traffic because they're trying to get over, seeing cars over here trying to get over, realizing that's the only place they can make a left turn. Some of those we control, I think, just with paint and paint happening sooner along on the, on the, on the freeway. And I think you could do those now. You don't need to wait for a project, so if they make sense. So otherwise, uh, support the recommendation to start on this, uh, the grant quest. Ms. Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to thank city staff. I have definitely have seen how much um, community outreaching you have done. And just to see the growth in that um, section in your department, I know it's been challenging because, I mean, the way we've conducted business for a while has just been different. And I think COVID really pushed everybody in the city to get out of our comfort zone. Um, but in especially in, in, in this area and like on the east side to have those engagements and then um, also stating here at the council that you guys will be doing more engagement um, even though this application will be submitted and also thank you so much for explaining why the importance of submitting this application. You mentioned it, you mentioned it a little bit on the application for the bridge but I think today it was very clear why staff is, is spending time on these applications. And um, I just really want to thank you because it, it really reflects that you are listening to our request and we can be all over the place sometimes, but re you guys are really listening to the community who at the end of the day is who we serve. So thank you so much for your work. And I will be seconding the motion of anybody. Has the motion been made yet? Oh, what I, I would like to. I would entertain one though. I, okay. I would like to make a motion to um, move staff recommendation um, to adapt. Yeah. Okay. Moved by Alejandro Gutierrez, second by Mike Jordan. Um, Mr. Gutierrez. Oh, you're good. All right. Very good. We have a motion and a second. Does everybody understand the motion? May we have the vote, please? Uh, yes. This is motion by Council Member Alejandro. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, yes, Council Member Alejandro Gutierrez, seconded by Mayor Tim Jordan for the staff recommendation. And please go ahead and vote. As you announced, we all present, absent uh, Megan Harmon. Very good. Um, any council member engagements? Thank you. Ms. Ms. Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm, I usually don't take advantage of this time, but I've, for the last couple months, I've been working with a lot of different groups um, in my district. They, with the concern of our, the housing crisis that we have, and I mean, from the different type of renters that we have from, you know, long-term residents, from students to uh, our local workers and also um, people that are, our voices normally we can't hear, we, we don't hear uh, from them because they don't have legal status in the U.S. Um, from business owners, uh, even teachers and principals, uh, developers and property owners. Uh, today I would like 
to request staff to explore different options for the housing trust fund. Um, and the housing trust fund we recently passed, um, and it's, it is to give um, money to the local nonprofits that provide housing and also to our local author uh, housing authority. My proposal goes a step further. It's uh, to expand the usage of the fund by providing loans to private property owners to build low and moderate, moderate income, while at the same time it will allow additional revenue to, trust, to the trust fund by the interest gained from the loans that will be filtered back to the trust and the construction of new units that will bring property taxes to our city. Some of, some of the benefits of the proposal will be to address the missing middle um, by creating housing stock that are underutilized sites and existing lots to preserve housing and community engagement and prior, prioritizing affordable housing at the fraction of the cost. In the proposal, I did research other cities that have similar Mayor models. House and Council Member Alejandra, I think we're getting more into a discussion topic. So okay. So I, I will be submitting the proposal and staff can, can look into it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further uh, comments or engagements? With that, we'll stand adjourned at 528.